Hello guys, good evening. How are you? Uh, I'm Elena Varduleki and uh, we have also Felix. Felix, say hello to the guys. Hi everyone. Thanks for making it here to our live stream. So we're, uh, yeah. sorry, yeah. You, we are your, mo are your moderators for tonight and we will make sure you have a very nice time watching us online uh, with a lot of astronomy things. Uh, Felix, do you want to introduce yourself? Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, lady. So uh, you might have seen me moderating AOT Live in Fiddlers, which is unfortunately closed now, so now we are online for you. And I'm a third year PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy, working on AGN jets. If you don't know what that is, uh, I think we're too short on time to explain, but you can watch some of our videos where these uh, kind of things are explained. Yes, and it's a very good subject. And uh, I am Elena Varduleki. I'm a postdoc at Max Planck, working on uh, also active galaxies in the center, well, the active nucleus of galaxies with uh, radio observations. And we have very special guests today that are going to talk a bit about radio astronomy and about uh, submillimeter astronomy and about how to use radio data to make music. So we have very, very fantastic uh, subjects. Um, so without uh, further ado, I will pass the mic to you. So you introduce our first speaker. Okay, uh, thank you, Eleni. So, ja, jetzt werde ich anfangen, auf Deutsch zu reden. Denn wir haben heute unseren, äh, einmal einen deutschen Programmpunkt mit einem Vortrag auf Deutsch. Und die Deutschsprachigen unter euch werden sich bestimmt freuen, weil sie das vielleicht ein bisschen besser verstehen. Und wir haben auch heute einen ganz äh, besonderen Gast, ein besonderes äh, Thema für euch. Das ist heute Reinhard Keller bei uns. Danke, dass du hier bist. Ja, ja. Und ähm, Reinhard hat, hat Elektrotechnik studiert äh, an der Uni in Erlangen und wurde später an der Uni Bremen am Institut für Hochfrequenztechnik äh, zum Doktor in Ingenieurwissenschaften promoviert. Da ging das schon mal mehr in die Richtung, was du jetzt machst. Denn du bist äh, schon seit 2005 am max planck institut für Radioastronomie beziehungsweise am Teleskop in Effelsberg, was dazugehört. Und bist da für die Entwicklung und Bau von den radioastronomischen Empfangssystemen beziehungsweise inzwischen für den, deren Betrieb und Wartung zuständig. Also ich, äh, erstaunlich, dass du schon alles äh, gemacht hast. Und natürlich äh, von mir auch danke an dich, weil äh, ich benutze Gasteleskop sehr gerne. Und es ist immer schön, wenn da alles läuft. <lacht> ja, freut mich. <lacht> okay, ähm, heute äh, wolltest du über Effelsberg und die Marsmission Inside reden und wie das zusammenhängt. Genau. So, so dann ja. werde ich mal versuchen, den Bildschirm zu teilen, um euch was zu zeigen. Es kann sein, dass das jetzt ein bisschen dauert, bis ich das hinkriegt. Fünf, gut. Jawohl. Heute ist natürlich auch für mich ein ganz schöner Tag, weil Radioastronomie ja. ist auch genau mein Fachgebiet. Gut. <lacht> Könnt ihr was hier meine Folien sehen? Fürchte nicht, ne? Ich sehe noch das äh, Skype-Fenster. Ja. Das ist einfach nur die PowerPoint-Präsentation da drüber legen, dann sollte es gehen. So. Da ist es. Da ist es, gut. Also, wunderbar. Ähm, ich erzähle was über Insight und ich habe im Untertitel das Ding genannt, ein Rocket Girl in Effelsberg. Das äh, hat eine ganz bestimmte Bewandtnis, da komme ich dann so ziemlich am Schluss drauf. Ähm, zunächst mal muss ich glaube erklären, warum äh, messen wir mit dem Radioteleskop äh, Effelsberg eine Marslandung. Also die NASA landet den Lander auf dem Mars und Effelsberg als Radioteleskop ist dabei. Das hat mehrere Gründe. Der erste Grund ähm, ist sicherlich, die NASA hat uns angefragt. Die NASA kann selber das, was sie da messen wollte, nicht messen. Und zwar will, wollte, wollte und will sie messen, der, das Signal des Landers während der paar Minuten Landung, die da abgeht. 
Das ist, sind die EDL-Phasen, nennt sich das Entry, Descent and Landing. Ähm, und zwar wird da das, das Signal gemessen, was direkt von dem Lander abgesendet äh, gesendet wird. Dazu braucht man einen Spiegel, der größer ist als die 70 Meter Schüsseln des, äh, der, der, des NASA Deep Space Network. Und man braucht einen Empfänger dafür. Und beides haben wir in Effelsberg. Der zweite Grund ist, äh, ist eher ein persönlicher Grund, das wollte ich, nicht, wollte ich auch noch erwähnen. Ich bin geboren 1958, ich war elf, als die Mondlandung war. Und ich saß vor dem Fernseher mit solchen Augen. Und äh, das hat ganz sicher auch meine Berufswahl beeinträchtigt. Und wenn man als, als, als Mensch, als Ingenieur so eine äh, Chance kriegt, da kann man einfach nicht Nein sagen. <lacht> Das, das zu, der, zu dem, warum wir das machen. Ich habe hier mal eine Folie mit, mit, ein paar, mit ein paar Daten. Die könnt ihr ja selber gerne lesen. Ganz interessant ist, die Anfänge dieses Projekts waren in 2012. Und sieben Jahre später, ist, also sechs Jahre später, ist man dann gelandet, Nämlich am 26. November 2018. Und da waren wir dann dabei. Gut. Ähm, für uns war es trotz alledem eine Herausforderung, das Signal überhaupt zu messen. Ich habe ja auch mal ein paar Zahlen zusammengestellt. Das Sendesignal auf dem Mars, 155 Millionen Kilometer entfernt, äh, beträgt äh, 10 Watt. Zur Information, ein, 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 ein Handy oder nimmer ein Decktelefon, da ist es klarer, ein Decktelefon hat ungefähr 2 Watt Sendeleistung. Das heißt, 5 äh, äh, von den Decktelefonen auf dem Mars äh, äh, sozusagen die Leistung addiert, wollen wir also auf der Erde messen. Ähm, da, da stehen ein paar äh, Leistungsangaben, also das geht runter auf äh, 10 Nanowatt, 0,01 Picowatt. Das geht nur mit Integration, wenn auch kurze Integration, so im, im paar Sekunden Bereich, also nicht die Stunden Integration, die wir so im, äh, im Radioastronomiebereich ähm, haben. Das ist damit man, äh, weil man nur so einen kurzen Landezeitraum messen will. Ne? Ja, kann genau. man nicht so lang integrieren. Ja. ja, man will Bewegung messen. Man will, letztendlich will man Bewegung messen und zwar, und zwar die, ähm, die, die Rotverschiebung. Und was das, was das heißt für uns, habe ich hier, ich mache da mal ein bisschen schneller durch, mal rausgefittelt, man sieht hier ein Spektrum, man sieht graue Linien, schwarze Linien im Grau, na, aber worauf es ankommt, ist hier die Umgebung der roten Linie. Die rote Linie ist das, was wir messen wollen vom Mars. Und man sieht hier rechts und links bis äh, über den Bildrand hinausgehen ähm, äh, RFI, also Radio Frequency Interference, ähm, andere, andere Sendeleistungen, ähm, äh, äh, die knapp daneben liegen. Und das ist schon, ähm, das war technisch schon eine Herausforderung. Das sind dann so Handymasten oder so, damit wir auch äh, telefonieren können. Das macht dann äh, radioastronomisch Probleme. Ne? Genau. Das sind, die, das sind die Dinge, die wir als Menschen so genießen. Na, und wo die, wo die Betreiber dieser Dienste, also Handy zum Beispiel, äh, unheimlich viel Geld bezahlt haben, dass sie da senden dürfen. Und wir beklagen uns, es sei ein, einfach nur ähm, ähm, Störstrahlung. Ein paar Frequenzen gibt es aber noch für Radioastronomen. Ne? Die sind fest dafür. Die ah, sind fest, aber die Astronomen kriegen ja auch nie genug und dann ist es einfach zu wenig. Werden die zufrieden, das stimmt. Ja, das ist richtig. Das ist auch gut so. Nur so gibt es äh, Fortschritt. Ähm, wir haben, um das überhaupt auszuprobieren, äh, probieren, haben wir ähm, Testmessungen gemacht. Wir, haben, drei, wir hatten drei Versuche. Und von den drei Versuchen ist der erste missglückt, weil da leider das Backend von der NASA nicht funktioniert hat. Das zweite, der zweite Versuch war für mich hochinteressant, weil es gab, guck ich mal, vielleicht könnt ihr meine Maus sehen, 
Es gab einen, einen Sandsturm am 10. Juni 2018 auf dem Mars und äh, hat das Solarpanel von der Mission Opportunity äh, bedeckt, so, sodass er keinen Strom mehr hatte. Und äh, ich kann euch sagen, ich hätte nie gedacht, dass mein berufliches Leben mal vom Wetter auf dem Mars abhängig ist. <lacht> Gut, der dritte Test, der war dann mit dem äh, Lander äh, Curiosity, das ist so ein kleines Krabbeltier. Äh, der hat eine Radionuklidbatterie, äh, ähm, der sendet immer, ob es staubig ist oder nicht. Und damit hatten wir also unsere Testmessungen und konnten anfangen. Da hat man dann dazu gelernt bei der NASA, dass das ja, verlässlicher ist. Genau, dass das verlässlicher ist. Und hier habe ich jetzt ein Filmchen. Ich hoffe, dass das auch abspielt, wo man die eigentliche Messung sehen kann. Ich lasse das einfach mal laufen und dann können wir gucken. Erstmal sieht man außer Rauschen gar nichts. Man sieht zwei Polarisationen und jetzt kommt hier so eine Linie durch. Und das ist Curiosity. Wer genauer hinguckt, der kann unten auf dem Frequenzband sehen, es, wir, wir bewegen uns in etwa über zwei, über, äh, über, äh, über wie viel? 1,2 Kilohertz Bandbreite, also sehr schmal. Aber man hat gesehen, die Linie läuft durch. Ähm, Curiosity sitzt an einer Stelle fest auf dem Mars. Wir sitzen mit unserem äh, Teleskop in Effelsberg und die Dopplerverschiebung, die wir gesehen haben, das war die, das war die, die Frequenzschiff, die da durchlief, die, äh, die sich verändernde Frequenzschiff, das liegt jetzt an, dem, an der Bewegung der zwei äh, Planeten Erde und Mars. Hier ist das gleiche nochmal aufgetragen mit dem NASA-Backend gemessen. Hier unten, äh, hier unten haben wir die Zeit. Hier haben wir die, die, äh, die Frequenzabweichung und man sieht, also über der Zeit gibt es hier so eine leicht gebogene äh, Kurve über der, über, der, ähm, über der Frequenz, wenn man über die Zeit geht. Und das ist auch genau das, was man dann beim, bei der Landung sehen will. Gut, nachdem das alles äh, geklappt hat, konnte es weitergehen. Und hier habe ich mal ein Bild, um einen Eindruck zu kriegen. So das sieht es dann bei NASA, bei in Pasadena aus. Man muss wissen, Pasadena, ähm, JPL, in Pasadena macht, äh, macht alle unbemannten Mars-Missionen und die bemannten, die, die finden dann an der, an der Ostküste statt. So sieht das Kontrollzentrum in Effelsberg aus, schon etwas äh, unstrukturierter und vor allem äh, überschaubarer. Aber wir hatten trotzdem viel Spaß. Und jetzt sehen wir hier das tatsächlich gemessene Signal von Inside während der Landung. Das, was wir hier sehen, wurde aufgezeichnet mit dem VLBI-Backend, das wir in Effelsberg haben. Man sieht es ganz deutlich, die Linie, noch sieht man sie. Sie läuft auch andersrum in der Frequenz. Und plötzlich ist sie weg was aber niemand äh, großartig gestört hat. Und ähm, irgendwann später, jetzt, wenn man viel Fantasie hat, sieht man ab und zu wieder eine ganz äh, ähm, schwache Linie an einer Stelle äh, auftauchen. Und zwar diese hier. Aber man kann schon sehen, es ist, äh, es ist ähm, sehr schwierig, da was raus zu interpretieren. Das Ganze ist eine Zeitrafferaufnahme. Und hier haben wir jetzt die Dinge ein bisschen rausgestellt. Man sieht, diese graue Darstellung ist die gleiche wie vorher. Die sieht jetzt etwas anders aus. Ähm, hier, hier, kommt, äh, hier kommen wir mit einer starken Biegung an. Dann geht es hier runter, dann ist hier kein Signal. Hier gibt es so ein bisschen Gekrusel. Und, äh, und dann ist es hier relativ stabil. Ich habe das mal rausgezoomt. Und jetzt sieht man hier, was, was, was die NASA aus dieser Beobachtung auch wirklich sehen wollte. Man fängt hier, hier vorne an bei AOS, Acquisition of Signal, fängt man an, überhaupt das Signal aufzunehmen. 
Und was hier passiert ist, der, der Fallschirm wird hier. Das ist noch nicht der Fallschirm, da, ist, da tritt, da tritt der, der Länder in die Marsatmosphäre ein und wird abgebremst. Das führt zu einer anderen Dopplerverschiebung und diese Kurve sieht man hier. Und dann geht es mit relativ ähm, konstanter Geschwindigkeit immer etwas, also man sieht noch eine leichte Biegung, geht es hier rein. Ähm, hier wird ein Telemetriesignal eingeschaltet, das heißt auf den Träger, hier vorne ist nur der Träger, ähm, vorne ist nur der Träger aktiv und dann kommt ein Telemetriesignal drauf, was dem eigentlichen Träger Energie entzieht, weil ja die Information drauf kommt in, in Form von, von äh, Phasenmodulation. Und dann kommt hier der Punkt, wo dann plötzlich das, ähm, das Signal ausfällt und das ist das sogenannte Plasma-Blackout. Was passiert Was da beim Plasma-Blackout? Das Plasma-Blackout, ähm, das ist ein Effekt, ähm, der, das, äh, der begründet sich aus dem, aus, aus dem schnellen Flug in eine Gasatmosphäre. Die Gase, die da, äh, in die das Ding reinfliegt, die werden ionisiert und, und ziehen sich als Plasmaschlauch rechts und links oder rundherum um den ganzen Länder, um das Hitzeschild herum und bilden so einen, so einen Abschirmschlauch um, äh, um die Kapsel, sodass aus diesem Schlauch keine Radiostrahlung mehr rauskommt. Ah, okay. Ja. Und ähm, erst als man, wenn, wenn hier, wenn es hier heißt AOS, wieder Acquisition of Signal, da ist, dann der, da ist man dann weiter im, im, ähm, im, in der Atmosphäre drin. Der Fallschirm wird, ähm, wird ähm, hochgelassen, das Ding wird langsamer und das Plasma reißt ab. Und dann sieht man hier, ganz leicht sieht man hier, ja, es gab, es gab eine weitere Verzögerung oder es gab eine Beschleunigung. Hier wird wieder, hier wird wieder ähm, verzögert und wenn man genau hinguckt, ähm, dann äh, können die Leute von der NASA, das ist jetzt eine schlechte Auflösung, die ich habe, können genau sehen, wann ist der Fallschirm aufgegangen, wann ist der abgeworfen worden, wann sind die Bremsraketen einge, äh, eingeschaltet worden und hier, wo dieser gerade Strich losgeht, da weiß man, okay, jetzt steht er auf dem Mars und sendet immer noch. Das heißt, wenn die Leute von der NASA das sehen, können die genau sehen, dass alles richtig gelaufen ist. Ja, genau. Und das ist auch, daraus erklärt sich auch der Sinn und Zweck, warum wir das messen sollen. Eigentlich kommen wir erst zum Tragen, ähm, wenn was schief geht. Das heißt, wenn das Ding einfach äh, sich nicht mehr meldet, dann möchte man wissen, was ist schiefgegangen. Was ist an der Landung selber schiefgegangen. Und das kann man aus diesem ganzen ähm, Zeit, aus diesem Zeitspektralfeld eben rauslesen. Wenn man gute Augen hat, klar. Gott sei Dank hat es funktioniert. Ja, Gott sei Dank hat es fun funktioniert. Ja, ich überspringe das mal hier. Das waren die zwei Gäste, die wir von JPL da hatten. Ähm, die, hochinteressant. Und da möchte ich auch noch ein paar Worte zu sagen. Äh, die Dame, die man da links sieht, ist äh, Sue Finley. Ähm, die ist äh, mittlerweile, nennt sie sich äh, Subsystem Engineer, äh, die ist, ist in dem zarten Alter von 82 Jahren. Das ist die Frau mit dem ältesten Zeitvertrag äh, bei, äh, bei der NASA. Die, ist, die hat 1957 geheiratet. Ich bin 1958 äh, geboren und äh, wollte eigentlich Ende nächsten Jahres in Rente gehen. Nur um so mal die, äh, die Verhältnisse zu zeigen. Ähm, dabei ist das den Puccino, junger Kerl, sehr äh, angenehme Leute, beides. Und was man äh, was nie vergessen werden darf, das sind die Peanuts, das sind die, äh, die, äh, die Erdnüsse. Das ist ein Glücksbringer, man hat festgestellt, ähm, Missionen, die im, nie, im, im, äh, in der EDL-Phase, also im, im Touchdown auf dem Mars, nicht beobachtet werden, gehen schief und Missionen, bei denen die Erdnüsse fehlen, gehen schief. Zwei unheimlich wichtige ähm, Tatsachen. 
da hat man da wissenschaftlich eine Korrelation festgestellt. Und ja, genau. Also auf die Funktion äh, bin ich auch noch gespannt, aber genau. Ähm, Susan Finley seit 1958 angestellt bei äh, JPL. Ähm, und zwar zwei Tage vor dem Start von Explorer 1. Das heißt, die hat sämtliche unbemannte Missionen bei der NASA persönlich mitgekriegt. Das muss man sich mal vorstellen. Wow. Und angefangen hat sie als Computer. Computer, das wusste ich auch nicht. Das war mal eine Berufsbezeichnung. Das hat dann ganz konkret so ausgesehen. Man hat junge Frauen sich geholt. Frauen vor allem, weil sie genügsam waren, muss man so sagen. Das Frauenbild in den 50ern war leider ein deutlich anderes. Sie waren sehr engagiert, waren diszipliniert und es waren alles Frauen von der Highschool, die gut in Mathematik waren und die zu der Zeit einfach in, in dem Berufsbild überhaupt keine Chance äh, hatten, unterzukommen. Es gab Krankenschwestern, es, es, gab, äh, es gab Sekretärinnen und es gab Hausfrauen im Wesentlichen. Ne? Aber als Ingenieur völlig, ähm, völlig äh, unvorstellbar. Und äh, die Damen saßen da, haben mit den ersten mechanischen Rechenmaschinen, die die Grundrechenarten äh, hatten, haben die zum Beispiel Trajektorien gemessen. Um, also ich komme selber auch aus der Feldtheorie, ich weiß, was Mathematik bede bedeutet, das waren keine einfachen Rechnungen und wenn man das mit vier Grundrechenarten und Bleistift und Papier machen muss, Hut ab. Das zeigt ein, ein Bild der Computers von 1953, etliche Frauen und was mich vor allem ähm, äh, verwundert hat, ist, gab damals auch schon eine, äh, eine äh, schwarze Frau drin in den, in, ich meine 1953, in den übelsten Zeiten von Apartheid und äh, äh, ähnlicher Politik. Heute sieht es so aus, Women at JPL äh, äh, deutlich anders. Dann hat die, ähm, die Sue Finley hat mir, hat uns ein Buch dargelassen, ein amerikanisches Buch, was die ganze Geschichte dieser Computers ähm, äh, beschreibt, nennt sich Rise of the Rocket Girls, ähm, kann in der Bibliothek in Effelsberg eingesehen werden. Leider gibt es nur in Englisch und im deutschen Buchhandel ist es leider nicht erhältlich. erhältlich. Ähm, man muss es dann von USA bestellen, denn das sind die Versandkosten, das Fünffache des Preises des Buchs. Es gibt aber auch eine, noch eine andere Lektüre, es gibt einen Kinofilm, den hat vielleicht der eine oder andere schon gesehen, was genau diese, diese äh, Geschichte der Frauen, der Computerfrauen in, äh, in, äh, bei der NASA beschreibt, die jetzt äh, äh, die drei Damen jetzt auf der Ost, äh, in der, an der Ostküste. Hidden Figures lief auch schon im Fernsehen und den gibt es äh, käuflich beim äh, bekannten äh, Großbuchhändler im, im Internet zum Beispiel. Ja. Wie geht es weiter? Wir sind auch schon angefragt wo worden, alle mit strahlenden Gesichtern natürlich, äh, für die nächste Mission. Ähm, die heißt Mars 2020 äh, und da wird ein, äh, ein Rover genannt, Uh, Perseverance, uh, per Perseverance Rover oder wie auch immer, uh, wird da abgesetzt. Das ist ein Kleinwagen in etwa mit sechs Rädern, also geländegängig auf dem, auf dem Mars. Um, hier habe ich ein paar Punkte drauf geschrieben, was will man alles um, damit messen. Die ESA hat die uns angeschaut. Äh, auch angefragt, die wollten eigentlich äh, zum gleichen Zeitpunkt landen. Die Landung wäre dann von dem Mars 2020, wäre am 18. Februar ähm, nächsten Jahres, 2021. Ähm, ab, und die ESA äh, musste leider ihren ExoMars Rover ähm, auf 2022 schon verschieben. Ja. Das war es im Wesentlichen, was ich zu erzählen hätte. Ja, dennoch, äh, Effelsberg ist äh, ziemlich gut gefragt für sowas. Hätte ich auch nicht gedacht, bevor ich äh, von dir davon gehört habe. Ja, vielen Dank. 
Ich finde das mit den äh, Frauen bei der Nase auch ganz faszinierend. Wir haben denen ja viel zu verdanken, wenn man sich überlegt, was wir durch so Weltraummissionen schon alles erfahren haben. Auf jeden Fall. Gut. Ähm, falls ihr es noch nicht äh, getan habt, ihr, wenn ihr euch das jetzt gerade live zuschaut, ihr könnt gerne eure Fragen in den Live-Chat schreiben. Und äh, Reinhard wird die dann auch gerne beantworten. Ja. Haben wir irgendwelche Fragen im Live-Chat schon? Wenn nicht, habe ich auf jeden Fall eine Frage. Ähm, wir, haben, wir hatten ja gesehen, dass ähm, Inside so etwa 200 Tage gebraucht hat, um auf den Mars zu kommen. Ne? Und ähm, wie lange braucht denn eigentlich das Signal vom Mars bis zu uns? Also zum Beispiel, wenn man das bei Inside gemessen hat im Vergleich. Das, das braucht 8 Minuten und 8,6 und, und Minuten. Also 8 Minuten 35 oder sowas. Das ist natürlich viel schneller und muss auch keine, keinen gebogenen <lacht> nee, Trajektorie folgen. Das ist richtig, aber es, es führt eben dazu, dass man, dass man auf dem Mars nichts ähm, live und nichts händisch machen kann. Oder so gut wie nichts. Weil die Reaktionszeiten zwischen, zwischen Kommando und, und Rückmeldung einfach zu lang sind. Ja, das heißt, wenn man jetzt irgendwelche Gegenschubraketen oder so zünden wollte, das würde alles nicht klappen, weil man acht Minuten in der Vergangenheit ist. Genau. Ja, da kann man nur gucken, dass man alles schon auf der Erde richtig macht. Genau. <lacht> und ich weiß nicht, vielleicht habt ihr mitge äh, mitgekriegt, es gab ja da mit einem der In Experimente, man will ja mit dem Inside, will man die, die Marsoberfläche, äh, will man untersuchen, die Temperaturverteilung. Und da gab es ein deutsches Experiment äh, von der DLR geführt, was damit an Bord ist. Das ist so ein, so ein Bohrhammer sozusagen, ein Stift, der sich selbstständig in die Oberfläche meißeln sollte und der hat äh, kläglich versagt. Und da will man jetzt versuchen, das ist jetzt relativ neu, die Entwicklung, da will man jetzt versuchen, mit dem Greifarm, den Inside hat, ähm, ganz langsam diesen Stift oben reinzudrücken in die Marsoberfläche. Jetzt muss man sich das vorstellen, man bedient, man bedient auf Sicht, wobei das, das gesehene Signal auch schon, auch schon knapp neun Minuten alt ist, einen Arm, der bewegt sich, neun Minuten später hat man die Reaktion und so weiter und so fort. Also das wird sicher ein, ein schwieriges Unterfangen. Das klingt spannend. Das heißt, würde man äh, so ein, jeder kennt das im Internet, ne, wenn man irgendwie ein bisschen lang, was langsam läuft, <lacht> muss man so ein bisschen hinterher sein. Ich glaube, ja. wir haben eine Frage. ja. Ähm, es wurde gefragt, äh, ob auch andere Missionen, äh, ich habe da schon mal kurz drüber geredet, ob es andere Missionen äh, beobachtet wurden auf dem Mars mit Effelsberg. Ähm, wir, hatten, wir hatten in der Anfangszeit von Effelsberg, in den 70er Jahren, meine ich war das, da hatte man, da hatte man eine Sonnenmission ähm, da hatte man eine Sonnenmission beobachtet oder mitbeobachtet. Davon weiß ich aus der Geschichte, ich bin jetzt ja auch in dem Alter, wo man so ein bisschen Geschichte sammelt vom Radioteleskop. Das machen immer die Alten so kurz vorm, vorm Ausscheiden. Und da war, muss es wohl was gegeben haben mit, mit so einer, mit, mit so einer Sonnenmission. Das ist auch spannend. Und ja. Man muss dann mit so einem äh, Teleskop auch aufpassen mit der Sonne, ne? ja, dass halt die Empfänger nicht durchbrennen. Muss man, dass das Aluminium nicht drunter tropft. Ja. <lacht> ähm, äh, zu Insight vielleicht. Ähm, was, gibt, was misst Insight denn eigentlich so alles auf dem Mars? Ja, also ein paar Infos. Ja. Um, Inside, Inside, also die ganzen Mars-Missionen Inside eingeschlossen, soll, die, die, die soll Aufschluss geben über die Beschaffenheit um, der, der, 
des Kerns und, und der Schale des Mars. Ja, über die Atmosphäre weiß man schon, äh, wohl schon relativ viel, aber die, die Beschaffenheit des Kerns, des, des äh, Planeten selber, da ist, das sind im, im Wesentlichen sind drei ähm, Experimente an Bord. Das erste heißt SEIS, S-E-I-S, seismische, das sind seismische Experimente. Ähm, da hat man äh, ganz witzig, da hat man äh, schon erste Erdbeben gemessen und man konnte auch einen Sturm nachweisen. Weil der Sturm ja an, an, an der Oberfläche äh, rüttelt und also äh, da gibt es auch schon die ersten Nachweise über, über so Stürme. Da weiß man jetzt schon relativ viel. Dann gab es das Ding, diesen Hammer, den ich gerade erwähnt habe, HP3 nennt sich das, Heat Flow and Physical uh, Properties Package. Also ähm, man, man wollte oder will damit fünf Meter tief in die, in die Marskruste und will da eine, eine Temperaturverteilung messen über, über der Dicke und äh, solche Dinge. Und dann gibt es noch ein, 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 äh, ein Radioexperiment, ähm, nennt sich RISE, Rotation and Interior Structure Experiment, das ist von der USA, von der NASA selber geleitet. Da stellen die quasi ein, äh, ein, äh, ein Signal, ein, ein statisches, einen statischen Beam, also ein, ein Signal in eine Richtung und messen jetzt während der Reta Rotation des Marses, wie der eiert, wie, sich die, wie der präzisiert oder was der genau macht. Auch wieder aufgrund Doppler schiften und 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 ne? und Feldstärken. Das sind so die drei, das sind die drei Experimente, die er an Bord hat. Das heißt, man kann quasi wirklich das Innerste vom Mars damit quasi sichtbar machen. Das sichtbar machen, naja, also aber in, darum, in gewisser Weise. <lacht> aber darum geht es, genau. Das ist wirklich sehr spannend. Ähm, haben wir noch mehr Fragen aus dem Livestream vielleicht? Ah, ja. ja, es gibt eine, genau, es gibt eine Frage. Kannst du, du kannst es lesen, Reinhard. Ich kann es lesen, Dann, ja, ja. Warum man also nicht, ich, warum, ja, erzähl. Ja, genau, die Frage ist, warum man, ähm, also ist, ja, ich habe gelesen, dass demnächst Gestein vom Mars zurückgeholt werden soll und ob es spezielle Gründe gibt, warum das nicht sowieso schon der bessere oder effizientere Ansatz ist. Ja, die, die Frage ist ganz einfach, weil man vom Mars im Moment einfach noch nicht zurückkommt. Das ist eine Frage der, der Antriebe, die man hat, der, der, der Trägerraketen. Ähm, ich kenne jetzt nicht die alleraktuellsten Zahlen, aber ich kenne die, ich weiß äh, zufällig die, die Zahl von, äh, oder die äh, Zahlen, sage ich mal, von der Ariane 5, was ja eines der mächtigsten, äh, ins, äh, ja, Raumvehikel ist, das wir derzeit haben weltweit. Und mit der Ariane 5, ähm, da, 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 könnte man etwa, da könnte man etwa eine Tonne weich auf dem Mond landen. Das heißt, man, hätte genügend, man könnte genügend äh, äh, Treibstoff äh, aufnehmen und, 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 um jetzt auf dem auf einem anderen äh, ja, Subplaneten in dem Fall zu landen. Die Zahl ist mir bekannt. Und ich denke mal, ob, ob Mond oder Mars, macht keinen großen Unterschied vom, vom Antrieb aus, weil man beschleunigt einmal und ist dann dort. Aber eine Tonne gelandet heißt, ich habe dann, hab dann nicht mehr genügend Treibstoff, um ein Vehikel wieder aus der, aus der Marsatmosphäre raus und zurückzukriegen. Ja? Oder es ist an der Grenze, oder es ist sehr schwer, oder es ist zu teuer. Aber das sind im Wesentlichen die Gründe, warum man, warum man jetzt erst einmal alle möglichen Dinge da hochschickt und dann guckt, äh, irgendwas zu äh, untersuchen. Es ist im Übrigen, die Frage ist sehr interessant, weil ich habe bei dem, bei dem Mars 2020 gelesen, die gehen jetzt her und sammeln tatsächlich Gestein ein und verstauen das in einer Box an ihrem Rover und warten darauf, dass jemand anders kommt und es zurückbringt. 
das ist dann schon mal ein effizienter Ansatz für die Zukunft. Ja, genau. <lacht> Sehr gut. Und irgendwie nachhaltig. <lacht> Das stimmt. Aber ich denke mal, wir werden es in äh, hoffentlich naher Zukunft tatsächlich schaffen, ja. Raketen zu bauen, die das wieder zurückbringen können. Es ist ja auch ein bisschen schwerer vom Mars wieder zurückzukommen, noch als vom Mond, weil der auch noch ein bisschen mehr Anziehung hat. Ne? Das, das macht ja. das ja noch mal etwas schwerer. Ne? Genau. Okay, dann würde ich sagen... Äh, Beenden wir jetzt mal diesen Teil von heute. Es gibt aber gleich noch viel mehr für euch. Der ist dann, die Teile sind dann wieder auf Englisch. Ähm, aber wenn ihr da keine Probleme habt, dann könnt ihr ja gespannt sein, was wir heute noch im Programm haben. Und äh, ich bedanke mich herzlich bei dir, Reinhard, dass du heute da warst und uns hier etwas über Effelsberg und das Rocket Girl erzählt hast. Gerne. Gerne wieder. <lacht> Tschüss. Tschüss. So, um, then I will give back to Eleni. Are you there? I am here. I am here. I did not disappear to get a beer. I still have my beer here. <laughs> so I, I wish uh, I could understand better, but this presentation was fantastic. And I wish uh, in the future we maybe have it in English also. But I think Anna has posted the summary on our live chat for the English-speaking audience, so they can have a look uh, on the topic. Uh, thank you very much, Felix and Reiner. That was a very nice discussion and presentation. And we will go to our quiz. So, uh, guys, I have posted it everywhere. The link is on Facebook. It's on Instagram uh, in the bio. So you can just click it on Instagram and you it will direct you to the uh, doc. It is on the live chat, what else? on, on Twitter. Twitter. So, so I, will I will give the mic to Sven, who will, will do the quiz, and, you know, play. And, and your, your chance, chance to win a big prize. prize. Sven, take it over. Yeah, uh, good morning and welcome to the quiz. Um, to can the everyone... Quiz. Um, can the everyone slide? I'm, I'm hoping you can slide. So, uh, yeah, I'm hoping today you can. We, we so, made a quiz, uh, yeah, today uh, quizy we, quiz, we made a radio quiz, edition. Uh, quizy quiz, um, radio edition. It was created by Sandra um, Green this time. It I was created by. It. Also, yeah. Guten Abend, herzlich willkommen uh, zu dem Quiz Radio Edition. Es wurde von Sandra und mir kreiert. Ich werde das heute präsentieren. Um, yeah, please all participate. You can win prizes. Uh, the link is posted down there bit.ly slash radio quiz. Bitte nehmt alle teil. Ähm, der Link steht hier unten auf den Slides und wurde auch im Chat gepostet. Äh, bit.ly slash radioquiz. Ähm, gut. Dann gehen wir zur ersten Frage. Let's move on to our first question. Um, the combined energy collected from every radio telescope since 1950 is equivalent to the kinetic energy of a falling snowflake, the kinetic energy of a car, the explosion of an atomic bomb or the explosion of a self-isolated parent. Also die Gesamtenergie, die von allen Radioteleskopen seit 1950 äh, aufgenommen wurde, ist äquivalent zur kinetischen Energie einer fallenden Schneeflocke, zur kinetischen Energie eines Autos, zu der Energie einer Atombombe oder zu der Energie, die ein Elternteil aufbringt, wenn es explodiert, weil es zu lange in der Quarantäne sitzt. Ähm... Hab noch 20 Sekunden. You've got about 20 seconds to answer the question. Um, and then we will move on to the next one. Five, four, three. Okay, moving on. Um, if aliens close to the star Sirius enjoy to listening to up-to-date German radio, they are right now dancing to... Uh, I say it would take bigger, or something like that, from Michael Tello, uh, Shape of You from Ed Sheeran, uh, 99 Red Balloons from Nena, or Philadelphia Freedom from Elton John. Also, wenn Aliens, die in der Nähe vom Sirius leben, zu tagesaktuellem deutschen Radio tanzen wollen, dann hören sie gerade uh, I say it would take bigger, 
ähm, Shape of You, 999 Luftballons oder Philadelphia Freedom? Uh, ihr habt wieder 20 Sekunden, um zu antworten noch. You've got 20 seconds to answer. Um, and then we will move on. Okay, moving on to the next question. The following object would have a signal strength equal to one of the brightest radio sources in the sky. A mobile phone on a mobile phone, a mobile phone on a plane at 10 kilometers altitude, a mobile phone on a satellite in low Earth orbit or a mobile phone on the moon. Also das folgende Objekt hätte die Signalstärke von den stärksten Radioquellen im Himmel. Entweder ein Handy auf einem Handy oder ein Handy in einem Flugzeug, was mit 10 Kilometer Höhe fliegt, ein Handy auf einem Satellit im niedrigen Orbit um die Erde oder ein Handy auf dem Mond. Again, you have 10 seconds left. Ihr habt noch 10 Sekunden zu antworten. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, if aliens on the closest exoplanets have monitored our radio emissions in the last century, the strongest signals they have received came from radio broadcasting towers, TV broadcasting towers, those evil 5G towers, or early warning radar that was used during the Cold War. Also, if aliens auf den nächsten Exoplaneten unsere Radioemissionen verfolgt haben im letzten Jahrhundert, um, danach haben die stärksten Signale, die sie wahrscheinlich bekommen haben, kommen von entweder Radiotürmen, Fernsehtürmen, den bösen 5G-Türmen oder dem Frühwarnradar, was im Kalten Krieg benutzt wurde. And again, there are about 10 seconds left. Es sind noch 10 Sekunden über. And moving on. You own a radio station and intend to make your song the most played song of all time by so playing only this song on repeat. You have to play that song for about 90 weeks, 90 months, 90 years or 90 decades. Also, euch gehört eine Radiostation und ihr möchtet euren Song zum meistgespielten Song machen. Uh, ihr müsstet ihn dafür 90 Wochen, 90 Monate, 90 Jahre oder 90 Jahrzehnte spielen. I should mention there has been a radio apocalypse and no other radio station is transmitting from today on. Also es gab eine Radiopokalypse. Keine andere Radiostation uh, hat, hat mehr Programm. Ansonsten wäre es unmöglich aufzuholen. Otherwise it would probably be un impossible to catch up. Um, again, 10 seconds left. Noch 10 Sekunden über. And we are moving on to the next question, which is Radio emission from the center of the Milky Way was first detected by Graham Bell, Otto Chaim, Buzz Aldrin or Carl Jansky. Also Radio emission vom Zentrum der Milchstraße wurden zuerst entdeckt von Graham Bell, Otto Chaim, Buzz Aldrin oder Carl Jansky. A bit of additional information, that radio emission is the one that is sent out by the supermassive black hole in the center in the Milky, of the Milky Way. Also diese Radiostrahlung wurde von dem, oder wird von dem supermassiven schwarzen Loch, was im Zentrum der Milchstraße liegt, ausgesendet. This question is a bit shorter, so you have 20 seconds left. Es gibt noch 20 Sekunden, die Frage war ein bisschen kürzer. Ten seconds, zehn Sekunden. And we are moving on to the next question, which is from 1998 to 2015, the Parkes radio telescope detected fast, uh, detected fast radio burst like signals. They turned out to be high altitude lightning, someone prematurely opening a microwave before the beep, solar flares, 
or signals from a classified and thus unreported aircraft. Also zwischen 1998 und 2015 hat das Parks Radioteleskop Signale entdeckt, die aussahen wie die Phase Fast Radio Bursts, über die wir letztes Mal geredet haben. Ähm, und zwar waren äh, diese wurden, waren aber entweder Blitze, die in großer Höhe entladen wurden, jemand, der zu früh die Mikrowelle aufgemacht hat, bevor sie fertig war, ähm, Solar Flares oder Signale von einem Top-Secret-Flugzeug, äh, des, die deswegen auch nicht äh, gemeldet wurden. Uh, this was a long question. You have only six seconds left to answer. Ihr habt noch sechs Sekunden zu antworten. Das war eine lange Frage. And we are moving on to the next one, which is the origin of the word radio is from the scientific term radiance, the element radium, the radius bone, or the Greek word, uh, yeah, my Greek is bad, radia, uh, which means to pass on. Also der Ursprung des Wortes Radio ist entweder vom wissenschaftlichen Term Radianz, vom Element Radium, vom Radiusknochen oder vom griechischen Wort Radia, was sowas wie weitergeben heißt. Um, you have about 20 seconds left. Ihr habt noch 20 Sekunden, uh, die Frage zu beantworten. Und danach gehen wir weiter. After that we're moving on. Okay, and we are moving on to the next question, which is the wow signal, the strongest candidate for extraterrestrial intelligent radio emission, was named after its discoverer, Jerry R. Wow. The sound it would make if one received it on a normal radio, a scribbled comment by an astronomer, or the game, and you just lost, I'm sorry. Um, also das Wow-Signal, der stärkste oder der beste Kandidat für außerirdische intelligente Radiostrahlung, wurde benannt nach ihrem, äh, dem Entdecker Jerry R. Wow, dem Geräusch, das es machen würde, wenn man es auf einem Radio abspielen würde, einem hingekritzelten Kommentar von einem Astronomen oder von dem Spiel, was ihr gerade verloren habt. Das tut mir leid. Um, again, you have 20 seconds left to answer. Ihr habt noch 15 Sekunden zu antworten. And we are moving on. Um, if you had tuned in to BBC Evening News on 18th April 1930, you would have heard economist John Coffey correctly predicting the year where the Second World War started, astronomer Edwin Hubble explaining the discovery of galaxies other than our own, biologist Alexander Fleming presenting the antibiotic effects of penicillium mold, or There is no news, followed by 15 minutes of piano music. Also, wenn ihr am 18. April 1930 die BBC Abendnachrichten gehört hättet, hättet ihr gehört, wie der Ökonom John Coffrey korrekt das äh, Jahr in der Zweite Weltkrieg beginnt, vorher gesagt hat. Der Astronom Edwin Hubble berichtet hat, dass wir Galaxien entdecken haben, die nicht die Milchstraße sind. Der Biologe Alexander Fleming die Effekte von Pelicillin beschrieben hat. Oder... Es gibt keine Nachrichten und 15 Minuten von Klaviermusik. Uh, long question again, you only have four seconds left to answer. Um, actually, this was the last question. Das war die letzte Frage. So, the winning strategy is get more than 25% of the correct answers. So, get more than randomly picked answers, correct? Then, ideally, be the randomly drawn winner and get your prize. Also, wie man gewinnt? 25% der Antworten müssen korrekt sein. Dann müsst ihr euch noch Mühe geben, dass ihr der zufällig gezogene Gewinner seid und dann bekommt ihr euren Preis. Ganz einfach. Um, please leave your email address. Bitte gebt eure E-Mail-Adresse an, uh, sonst können wir euch nicht kontaktieren. We won't be able to contact you otherwise. Okay, we will be moving on to the solutions now. So this is the last chance to send in your responses. Afterwards, we will not accept them anymore. Also schickt jetzt eure Antworten ab. Danach werden wir sie leider nicht mehr annehmen können, weil wir präsentieren jetzt die Lösungen. Uh, okay, then let's move on to the solutions. Wir gehen zu den Lösungen. 
The first question, the combined energy collected from every Railsley radio telescope since 1950 is equivalent to, also die, die Gesamtenergie, die von allen Radioteleskopen der Welt gesammelt wurde seit 1950, ist the kinetic energy of a snowflake, also die kinetische Energie einer Schneeflocke. This is about 30 microjoule, also 30 microjoule. Um, it's what a toaster uses in one one ten millionth of a second. Also in einer zehn Millionenstel Sekunde benutzt ein Toaster mehr Energie, als alle Radioteleskope der Welt jemals aufgenommen haben. Um, by the way, this, this, this uh, image was taken with a scanning tunneling electron microscope, which I think is very fascinating. Also es wurde mit einem Rastertunnel Elektronenmikroskop aufgenommen. Uh, faszinierende Dinge, aber naja, uh, nicht nicht relevant, grad, not, not relevant now. Um, if aliens close to the star series enjoy listening to up-to-date German radio, they are right now dancing too. So when aliens auf einem uh, Planeten, der in der Nähe von Sirius ist, aktuelles deutsches Radio hören, tanzen sie gerade zu. Well, we have to think eight years into the past, because um, Sirius is eight light years away. Also wir müssen acht Jahre in die Vergangenheit denken, weil Sirius acht Lichtjahre weg ist. So we're looking for the number one chart song of German Radio in 2012, also der Nummer 1 Chartsong vom Deutschen Radio 2012 war Eisce Eotepego, um, the Nossa Nossa Song, also der, der Nossa Nossa Song. Ich, ich kannte den Namen auch nicht, aber ja, dann, dann kennt man ihn doch. Um, okay, moving on. We have uh, the following object would have a signal strength equal to one of the brightest radio sources in the sky. Also das folgende Objekt hätte eine Signalstärke gleich, gleich stark wie die, wie die hellsten Radioquellen auf dem Himmel. And that is uh, a mobile phone on the moon, also ein Handy auf dem Mond. So a mobile phone has a transmission power of about one watt and the moon is 400.000 kilometers away. And that makes up for one of the strongest or that would make up for one of the strongest radio sources. Also, ein Handy hat eine Strahlungsleistung von 1 bis 2 Watt. Der Mond ist 400.000 Kilometer weg. Und das wäre eine der stärksten Radioquellen. So, this tells you how sensitive radio telescopes are. Plus the first question with the snowflake. Also, das, das zeigt euch nochmal, wie sensitiv Radioteleskope wirklich sind. Wie, wie genau wir Sachen messen können. Um, okay. If aliens on the closest exoplanets have monitored our radio emission in the last century, the strongest signals they have received come, came from. Also, wenn aliens auf nahen exoplaneten unserem Radio zugehört hätten, kämen die stärksten Signale von. The early warning radar, das Frühwarnsystem. Uh, the reason for that is very simple. Radio broadcasters don't get paid by other planets to broadcast their stuff, so they don't have a transmission power to reach other planets. Also, unsere Radiostationen werden von anderen Planeten nicht bezahlt, dass, man, dass sie empfangen werden. Also haben sie auch nicht genug Leistung, um auf andere Planeten empfangen zu werden. Das ist reine, reiner Geiz. Uh, the early warning uh, radar is a system of powerful radio antennas that was used to detect uh, launches by nuclear missiles, missiles. And that included some fancy techniques like bouncing rays off the atmosphere to increase the range. Also das, das Frühwarnsystem war ein System, extrem leistungsfähiger Radargeräte, um Interkontinentalraketen äh, zu entdecken. Und die haben unglaublich ausgefeilte Techniken benutzt, zum Beispiel die Radarstrahlen an der Atmosphäre abprallen lassen, um, um die Reichweite zu, äh, zu erhöhen. Um, there is one more power, uh, one uh, radio broadcaster that is even more powerful, which is the Arecibo Telescope which is basically a radar flashlight, just that we're not using it for something here on Earth, we're using it to, to shine at Mars, at Venus. Also das Arecibo Teleskop in äh, Mexiko kann einen noch stärkeren Radarstrahl aussenden, der genutzt wird, um andere Planeten anzustrahlen um, und, und, und nicht hier auf der Erde das anzustrahlen. But this beam is very narrow, so it's basically impossible that it's detected by something that it's not pointed at. Also der Strahl ist sehr, sehr eng. Also es ist eigentlich unmöglich, dass es entdeckt wird von einem Planeten, auf den wir nicht gerade strahlen. Um, okay. You own a radio station and you tend to make your favorite song the most played song. Also ihr habt eine Radiostation und möchtet euren Song zum, zum uh, am meisten gespielten Song machen. Wie lange müsst ihr ihn spielen? How long do you need to play it? The answer is 90 years. Also die Antwort ist 90 Jahre. Um, it's, it's simple math. 
the most played song, according to, to some sources, is uh, Every Breath You Take by The Police. It's a bit tricky because there's no actual reports on which radio plays which song. Also, it's not ganz einfach festzustellen, welcher Song der wirklich am meisten gespielte Song ist, weil keiner da mitzählt. Uh, aber wahrscheinlich ist es Every Breath You Take von The Police mit 11 Millionen Mal. So 11 million times times 4 minutes is about 85 years. Also wenn ihr einen 4-Minuten-Song 11 Millionen Mal spielen wollt, müsst ihr ihn ungefähr 85 Jahre spielen lassen. Ja, um, yeah. moving on to the next question. Uh, radio emission from the center of the Milky Way was first detected by, also Radiostrahlung vom Zentrum der Milchstraße wurde zuerst erst entdeckt von. The answer is Carl Jensky. But it's a bit tricky because he was working for Bell. He was working for the Bell Telephone Laborator Laboratories, which were founded by, by Graham Bell. Um, also es war Carl Jensky, aber er hat für die Bell Telephone Laboratories uh, gearbeitet, die von Bell gegründet wurden. Um, und zwar, sein Job war, atmosphärische Störungen in Radiosignalen zu untersuchen. Und er hat eine Störung gefunden, die sich alle 23 Stunden und 56 Minuten wiederholt, was ein Zeichen dafür ist, dass sie von außerhalb des Sonnensystems kommt, weil sich die Erde in 23 Stunden und 56 Minuten genau einmal um sich selber dreht. So he, he was uh, investigating sources of atmospheric disturbances in radio and he found a, a noise source that repeated every 30, uh, 23 hours and 56 minutes, which is a strong signal for that source being outside of the solar system because this is the time the Earth takes to turn once around itself. Um, yeah. Next question. From 1998 to 2015, the Parkes radio telescope detected fast radio bursts like signals. They turned out to be. Also die Signale, die zwischen 1998 und 2015 vom Parkes radio telescope entdeckt wurden, waren der komische Mikrowellenhintergrund, the strange microwave background. So it was someone opening a microwave before it was done. So some of the radiation escaped and was detected by the telescope. Also... Jemand hat die Mikrowelle ausgemacht, bevor sie gebiebt hat und, all die, äh, und ein bisschen dieser Strahlung ist entkommen und wurde vom Teleskop aufgenommen. Um, the problem was, they looked extremely similar to the first detected uh, fast radio bursts. Also sie, sie sahen sehr, sehr ähnlich aus wie die fast radio bursts, die bis dahin entdeckt worden waren. Um, aber man hat sehr, sehr schnell herausgefunden, dass sie nicht außerhalb der Erde kommen, weil... Sie kamen meistens mittags und sie wurden nur an diesem Teleskop gemessen. So it was clear very soon that it was not extraterrestrial. It was a terrestrial signal because it always occurred around noon and uh, it only occurred at this telescope. Um, okay, the origin of the word radio is from the scientific term radiance, the element radium, the radius bone or the Greek word radia. Also der, der Ursprung des Wortes radio ist... Und die Lösung ist, the solution is the scientific word radiance, the, das, das wissenschaftliche Wort radianz. So the radium and the radius bone were both named after the Latin word radi radio. Um, also der, der Radiusknochen und radium wurden beide nach dem lateinischen Wort radio benannt. Um, and we made up the Greek word. Also das griechische Wort haben wir uns einfach nur ausgedacht. Um, Then the wow signal, the strongest candidate for extraterrestrial intelligent radio emission, was named after, also das wow signal, der beste Kandidat für außerirdische intelligente Radiostrahlung, wurde benannt nach. And you see it here the scribbled comment by the astronomer who found the signal. Also hier seht ihr das hingekrit den hingekritzelten Kommentar von dem Astronomen, der das entdeckt hat. Um, the signal was so strong and so long that he couldn't help but scribble this. Um, also das Signal war so stark und so lang, dass, dass er das einfach hinschreiben musste, quasi. Um, and yeah, so there are no explanations, no natural explanations for this signal. Uh, es gibt keine natürliche er äh, Erklärung für das Signal. Wir wissen nicht, was es erzeugt haben kann. Um, and one interesting thing is, I told you about the, the Arecibo telescope being a radar beam to investigate other planets. This is pretty much how it would look like if another planet received it. Also ich habe euch gerade von dem Arecibo Teleskop erzählt, was andere Planeten anleuchten kann. Ähm, ziemlich genau so würde das aussehen, wenn, wenn das auf einen gerichtet wäre. 
Ähm, es wurde niemals wieder gefunden, es hat sich nicht wiederholt und wir haben keine Ahnung, was es ist. So it was never found again, it did not repeat and we have no idea what it is. Um, yeah, if you had tuned on to BBC Evening News on 18th April, you would have heard, also wenn ihr am 18. April 1930 die BBC Abendnachrichten gehört hättet, dann hättet ihr gehört, wie der Reporter sagte, there is no news. Es gab einfach keine Nachricht. So, um, yeah, times have changed. Uh, there is no day without news today. Um, interesting, both other, okay, uh, let, let me go back here. The Economist thing, we made that up, that is completely untrue. But actually, Edwin Hubble did detect that galaxies uh, outside of our galaxy existed before there was a debate, the, the so-called Shapley-Curtis debate, whether those nebula you saw were nebula within our galaxy or outside of our galaxy. And that was uh, solved by Hubble in 1923, so pretty close. Also Hubble hat tatsächlich uh, diese diese Entdeckung gemacht. Es gab, ein, es gab eine große Debatte, ob die Nebel, die man sieht, ob die innerhalb unserer Galaxie sind oder andere Galaxien außerhalb unserer Galaxie. Und 1923, also relativ nah 1930, hat Hubble das tatsächlich auch gelöst. Und Penicillin wurde 1927 von Alexander Fleming entdeckt, also auch relativ nah an diesem Zeitraum. So, Penicillin mold was detected, or the, the antibiotic properties of Penicillin mold were detected by Alexander Fleming in 1927. So, also pretty close to that date, but there was no news on that day. And yeah, with that, that was the quiz. With that, I thank you for participating. Uh, we will notify the winner by email and I hope you had fun. And with that, I go back to you, Eleni. Oh, fantastic. Okay, I think I got everything wrong. Can I still ask for a question from the audience, from the chat? Ah, yes, of course. Um, so, someone is asking, is there any resemblance between the wall signal and a fast radio burst? Um, no. The wall signal lasted for 70-something seconds, and the fast radio bursts last for, for, I think, milliseconds or something like that. So, there's no similarity between those. Great, thank you. Am I allowed to speak? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <Rob>. <laughs> <Cheers>. <laughs> okay. Yes, I was yeah. saying that I got everything wrong, and I hope I win a prize for all wrong. No. Okay. No. No prizes no. for me. No. No prizes for me. But it's okay. Uh, that was the best quiz ever. I have to say, the best, uh, and we learned so much about radio astronomy. Much more. Now we will switch a bit. I uh, will go to a mysterious effect uh, in submillimeter. Okay, still radio. Uh, and we will welcome mode. Some, okay, I have to pronounce it right. It's a very nice French name. Sarmenton. Yes. Yes, yes. I knew it. The, the one year of French lessons have done, done their, their, their thing. thing. Okay. okay. <laughs> Welcome, mode. And uh, uh, we will also have later uh, Anna Mikler with us. Uh, Anna is currently doing the live chat, so you can bug her and uh, do, you know, ask your questions. And we will uh, discuss a bit more on this mysterious SZ effect. But uh, let me introduce mode before we start discussing about this, I don't know, I, I don't think many people have heard about this effect. And, yeah. uh, right? It's, yeah. a, it's a bit of a mystery what it is, and it has a peculiar name, so you will tell us all about it. But uh, let me introduce you first. Uh, Maud is a PhD candidate uh, working at the Ange Argelander Institute for Radio Astronomy at the University of Bonn at the Submillimeter Group. Uh, she has a Bachelor in Fundamental Physics from Paris. I don't know what the XY is. I don't remember yeah, my, yeah, end. <laughs> my, <laughs> my uh, numerals, okay, university. Uh, and a Master's of Astrophysics from uh, Strasbourg University. Uh, and it's also, Maud is also a member of Astronomy on Tap Bonn. So, 
whoever has been to our live events uh, at Fiddlers uh, has seen mode there. And today we will talk about, this is your research, right? This is what you are investigating yes, yes, uh, exactly. in your research. Uh, so let's start uh, with your presentation and we'll go, we'll go along. Please yes. start. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I guess the first thing you might ask yourself is, what is the this Sunny Dovich effect? What is this name? Where does it come from? Because it's not very intuitive, let's say. So this name actually comes from the two scientists who predicted it. So those scientists uh, are Rashid Sunny here and were Jakob Zeldovich here. So they they were both Russian scientists. Um, and uh, Hachid Saniev was actually the uh, PhD student of uh, Jakob Zeldovich. So, of course, because he was his PhD student, he was getting instruction and he was being guided by uh, Jakob Zeldovich on what to do, what to investigate. And together, they predicted the effect in 1969, which is quite some time ago, actually. Um, it was fantastic. But, the same year that uh, we sent... Uh, uh, humans to the moon, to land on yes. the moon. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's actually right. Yeah. Um, okay, so you might wonder now what is this uh, Sanya Ibrandovich effect? So actually, it's a collection of effects. There is many flavors, let's say, of the SZ effect, but they are all based on the fact that the photons, which are the light particles, can have their energy modified by the presence of galaxy cluster. So their energy might change when they go through galaxy cluster. Now you might ask yourself, but what are galaxy cluster? So it's a group of galaxies, of plenty of galaxies. Actually, it can contain around 100 to 1,000 of galaxies. So it's quite huge. It's actually the biggest, the largest gravitationally bound structure in the universe. So they are bound together, all those galaxies, by gravities, and they are the largest structures that work that way, actually. So here you have, for example, a schematic of a galaxy cluster, and on the right here you have a, an Im a real image of a galaxy cluster, so you can see many galaxies. So um, all these galaxies belong to the same unit, right? To the same uh, cluster, the ones we see on the right in the yes. image. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yes. So, they are all part of this big group of galaxies that we call galaxy cluster. And, and as a... Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, go on, yeah. <laughs> no, I was just, uh, just going to say, just to remind to people from home that uh, galaxies are made up of uh, hundreds of billions of stars, right? Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. So this cluster contains a lot of uh, information. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, sun, a lot of star. Not not all of the star are like the sun, but a lot of stars, a lot of planets, also probably um, a lot of gas. Um, it's very complex physics in uh, <laughs> happening inside. Yes, yeah. uh, I I can give you an example of a group of galaxy. Uh, to sort of give you an idea, so maybe you know that uh, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is actually in a group of galaxies and other objects. This group is called the local group, and for example, you have also Andromeda Galaxy, which is part of our local group. Um, so, yeah, we are also ourselves part of a galaxy cluster, sort of. Um, so, as I was telling you, this SZ effect is about photons, the light particle, having their energy modified by the presence of galaxy cluster in the universe. But it's not any photon, actually. It's the photons coming from the cosmic microwave background. So, we speak about SZ effects only when those photons coming from the cosmic microwave background have their energy modified by galaxy cluster. But Maybe you might wonder, what is the cosmic microwave background? We do, so, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell us. Yeah, to put that in maybe a very uh, uh, small sentence uh, and very clear, we could say that it's the first light of our universe, sort of, which is quite amazing. 
to get into more detail about how that happened and what it is exactly, I'm going to guide you a bit around the, uh, the history of our universe. You can see here an image with like all uh, the history of our universe as we see it today. So as you may know, there was a big bang at the very beginning and then uh, an inflation phase where we say that the universe beca became very big in a very small amount of time. Uh, yeah, it's 10 to the power minus 32 seconds. So it's really, really fast. And only one second after the, the big bang, actually, we were left with a dense uh, soup, a dense plasma with uh, plenty of particles inside. So photons that are the light particles, electrons, quark, a big soup of particles, very dense and very hot. What happened to the light particle? Um, at that moment is what I want to show you with a small video. So imagine that those orange points are the electrons. Uh, actually, at the beginning of the universe, it was so dense, there were much more electrons than there is on this very small simulation. But just to give you an idea of what is happening exactly, uh, if we have a photon inside uh, this very hot and very dense uh, plasma, what is going to happen is that the photon is going to scatter on the electron. So as you can see, it's getting absorbed by an electron, by an orange uh, ball, and getting emitted in another direction, in a totally different direction. So as you can see, it sort of stays trapped. It cannot really escape because each time it's going to try to move, it's going to eat one of those electrons. Um, so what happened is that all the photons uh, present in this hot gas are getting absorbed by the electrons. So they're sort of trapped. They cannot really escape uh, this dense gas. To give you an example in numbers, so one second after the Big Bang, in this very dense gas, photons can travel only 10 to the power minus 10 meters, uh, which is roughly the size of an atom, before they get absorbed by an electron. So they can barely move, actually. And because of that, we say that the universe was opaque. No light could really escape. It was dark, basically. Um, for example, nowadays, photons can travel 10 to the power minus 6 meters before they interact with something else. Uh, wow. so, yeah. that, that is not, uh, that's not much uh, space they have there. They're really trapped, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so they, we, could not, we cannot see them. Exactly. That's, that's yes. the point, yes. And yeah, what yeah. changes? Yeah, so there were no lights because they were trapped by the electron. But what happened is that uh, the universe, which is expanding, so the gas, you know, when a gas is expanding, then it cools down. And it's exactly what happened with the universe. The, the primordial plasma gas gets cooled down because of the expansion. And at some point, it's cool enough for atoms to form. And you might know that atoms are composed of the nucleus and the electrons. So all the electrons that were before going freely around and uh, absorbing the photons, they are now trapped with the nucleus uh, inside an atom. And at that time, the photons do not scatter on the electron anymore. They are not trapped anymore. They can escape. And at that time, we say that the universe became transparent because for the very first time, light was able to escape this dense soup that was the universe before. So that happened actually uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, so quite a long time ago. Uh, we call this epoch rayonization. And the very first light that was able to escape the very first light of our universe is this cosmic microwave background that we see here, for example. So this image is an image of the cosmic microwave background, so of the very first light of our universe. And you may recognize this looks exactly like uh, the Earth being uh, projecting onto a uh, flat 2D uh, map. So it's usually a sphere, a sphere, but you project it and it looks like that. And what you might see is that there is some regions that are more red. So where there is more temperature, because what this map represents is the uh, fluctuation of the temperature at the 
a tiny light was able to escape for the very first time. So you can see region where there were more light, more energy and more particles when it was denser than other parts of the universe, which is absolutely amazing because then you have a map of how the structure of the universe was at the very beginning, actually. That is fantastic. Uh, you talked a bit about temperature. Uh, is the universe hot at that moment? And how does it compare to earlier epochs before it became visible to us? Yes. So uh, the universe was at the beginning, of course, extremely hot. <laughs> Uh, we, by the way, physicians have trouble really uh, explaining what was hot at the time of the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, with expansion, it cooled down. Um, I'm not sure exactly the number, uh, the temperature of the temperature of the CMB at the time of emission. But, of course, it was, it was much hotter than it is nowadays. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, some easy numbers, okay, because I did a presentation on that uh, and I have them in my mind just for our audience, it's around 2,800 Celsius, so the temperature that we understand uh, in Europe. Uh, and before the universe, when we were talking about this, uh, before atoms started forming, it's millions of uh, degrees, and now it's minus, minus 270 Celsius now in, in the current uh, universe. So there's a big difference of how it cooled. Uh, please uh, continue. Sorry. No problem. Thank yeah. you for the numbers. Yeah, I think that's really nice to have them. So, yeah, to go back to this Sonia Evzeldovich effect, it's the fact that the CMB photons get their energy modified when they pass through galactic clusters. But you might ask, like, how does that happen? So the, C the CMB occurs very far away in the past, uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So it's quite far away from us. But those photons that were emitted at that time, they're still present nowadays. And when they reach us, when we measure them on Earth with telescopes, they have gone through all the universe and sometimes They've gone through structures, as you could imagine on a picture like that. And sometimes they pass through galaxy cluster. And in galaxy cluster, there is very hot gas. And then they're going to interact with this hot gas and gain uh, energy and have their energy modified. So that's what is the Z effect, actually. So they get more uh, energetic, right? Yes. They, yes. they, steal, the, they steal the energy from from the electrons they interact uh, with, uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could say that, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good image, yes. Um, yes. So uh, there is, uh, as I told you at the beginning, different type of FZ effects. But what I might told you is that all of those Sonia Evzeldovich effects are actually very small. Um, actually, I've heard that uh, Zeldovich did not want it to publish the paper because he thought we would never be able to do science with them because they're so small. He thought they would never be detected even. But that's not the case today with our telescopes uh, that are very powerful. We are able to see it and to deduce plenty of things from it. So that's really interesting. I'm going to mention two effects that are really easy to explain. So the thermal SZ effect and the kinematic SZ effect, you can see that the thermal SZ effect is 100, around 100 micro Kelvin. So it's really, really small. It's uh, 110 to minus 6 Kelvin. And the kinematic SZ is even smaller. To give you a comparative example, as Eleni said it very well, the CMB temperature nowadays is 2 Kelvin, which is roughly minus 273 degrees Celsius. I got it right. <laughs> yes, yes. And you have to imagine it's 10 to the power minus six, minus 6 smaller than that. And of course, the CMB photons are uh, still present in our universe and they are dominating. So those effects are under, under those uh, very, very hot, very cold, but actually much hotter than those effects photons. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so 
let's give you uh, uh, an explanation of this thermal Z effect. Now you have everything to understand it. So as I told you, the CMB was emitted very far away in the past 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And the photons from this very first light, they, they, they travel through the universe. And while traveling, they lose energy. But sometimes they, they pass through galaxy cluster. And in galaxy cluster, there is very hot ionized gas. So a bit like the, the, at the beginning of the universe, there is three electrons moving around. And so those photons that are very cold, they're going to scatter on those very hot electrons. We say inverse Compton scatter. So what happens is that you have a low energy photon coming from the CMB that is going to meet a very high energetic photon. And it's going, as Eleni said, it's very well, it's going to steal the energy from the electron, basically. So you're going to obtain a high energetic photon and a low energetic electron. And what happens is that then those CMB photons have more energy than they should, and they're going to reach us on Earth when we can measure them. So what happened exactly is that because we have this relation between the energy and the frequency, so the energy is just a constant uh, multiplied by the frequency. So when you have a high energy, you have also a high frequency. So as I told you, the CMB photons are supposed to be very low energy, very low frequency. But when they go through galaxy cluster, they gain energy. So they, they have higher frequency than they should. So when we observe the sky, and especially the CMB, at different frequencies, as you can see here, for example, 44 gigahertz or 545 gigahertz, we're going to see a deficit here in blue. So less photons at low frequency because the CMB photons that were supposed to be here when there is a galaxy cluster, they have gained energy. So there is less photon than it should and more photons at high energy. They have been moved sort of. And that is the thermal SZ effect. You can see here, for example, in terms of a curve, so at low frequency, when you look at the CMB at the spot of a galaxy cluster, you have less photons at low frequency than you should and more photons at high frequency than you should. Because of that, you can actually, when looking at the sky, you can pinpoint and count where are the galaxy cluster because of this effect. So it's quite amazing. Ah, so you can uh, trace in the yes. sky the galaxy clusters. So that's also a good tool Another way to find galaxy clusters uh, in the sky, right? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, basically, as we already said, uh, thanks to this thermal SZ effect, so the fact that the CMB photons that are called gain energy on the very hot electrons, we can count galaxy clusters, which is uh, very interesting for astrophysics, of course. Is this, uh, uh, sorry, is this uh, very common for the photons coming from the CMB? Does it happen to all of the photons? Or no, some? it's actually very little, yes. Uh, you're doing very well to mention it, yeah. So it's a small, it's a very small percent, but yet we yeah. can uh, detect uh, the clusters uh, through that because the difference is so big in the energy they steal. Oh, wow, that is, that's an amazing effect. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, I like it at least. And, and to imagine that uh, uh, who was Sin Sinayev that he didn't want to publish it. Uh. Yeah, yeah, it's actually a very famous effect in astrophysics. And uh, it's uh, growing a lot because the telescopes are now getting so precise that we are actually able to measure those effects very well and understand them and use them for cosmology, but also for astrophysics. So uh, it's really something that is uh, only getting more and more used. Um, yeah. Good. Please continue. <laughs> yeah. So the, the last effect I want to talk mm -hmm. to you about is the kinematic SZ effect, which is actually the effect I'm working on for my PhD. So it's going to be very simple. It's pretty much the same idea as the thermal SZ effect. So it's the photon coming from the CMB that scatter on the electrons, but this time it's not only the odd electrons, so it's not only the electrons that are very odd, that have a lot of energy, 
it all the electrons that are uh, undergoing the motion of the cluster, all the electrons that are moving, because you have to imagine those galaxy clusters, they, they are not fixed, there is velocities inside of them, they are moving uh, in the universe, and those electrons are also uh, going under this motion, they are also moving, and so this effect occurs when the CMB photons scatter on uh, the electron that has a motion. Um, and what is interesting about this effect is that with that, you can gain some information on the velocity of the cluster because the effect is actually proportional to the velocity itself, the velocity of the electron. So that's a really interesting effect so far astrophysics and cosmology. Good. That is a very interesting effect and uh, uh, apparently it's a very useful tool to understand our universe. Is that correct? Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. So yes. Uh, let's uh, add Anna to this conversation. I think uh, that's the I right think, moment. I uh, think that's the right moment uh, uh, to also to share some also inputs, share some of what, inputs on what we have discussed. What we have discussed. Um, um, and uh, and, uh, and continue and talking, continue about, this, talking uh, about this mysterious uh, effect. Mysterious I mean, effect. I maybe mean, some of maybe the some of the that people watching us right now have never heard of this before. Yeah. But as you said, in the future, it's gonna be uh, much more useful with uh, higher um, sensitivity uh, telescopes, right? Yeah, more yeah. detections. Well, uh, yes, that effect has been useful. I mean, it's gonna mm -hmm. be more useful because the sensitivity is better. Mm -hmm. But it is the instrument that has allowed us to detect the most galaxy clusters, confirmed galaxy clusters. So, it you know, even since the long time, we've been, like, we knew around hundreds of galaxy clusters around 20 years ago. And then SPT came and gave us around two, uh, South Pole Telescope gave us around 2,000 clusters. And then we got similar with uh, Planck, which is a space mission. But... When we are where we are now, is we expect to detect ten thousands of galaxy clusters. So we are going one level above, you know. But it's the biggest tool that you have to detect them. That is fantastic, uh, and uh, I think you had uh, some input on something we discussed with uh, Mode that I already forgot because the beer is getting into my brain very fast, fast faster than the CMB yeah. photos are coming. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Faster yeah. than the CMB photons are coming to us, of course. Uh, so please elaborate on the question. Uh, what on we the were discussing. Ah, yes, yes. We were. I, I just got confused. So Maud yes. was saying that uh, the energy change is so high that, you know, that's why we detected. But really it's not that the energy is so high because, you know, the change is very small. If you see the difference in the Kelvin in the temperature, 10 to the minus 6 is like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 6. Or one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's more about like it's such a specific pattern, mm -hmm. right? Like so, imagine that you always have the same shadow, right? It's exactly the same shadow. So you can always detect this shift if you know exactly how that's gonna look, right? You ah. can predict that at every step that is so specific. You know, this must be this specific effect. It's nothing ah, else. So it has a characteristic signature, and you're looking for that in the data. And this is how you find it. Yeah, so Mod introduced the, a, a beautiful graph mm -hmm. showing like this curve pattern. So that's the change in intensity. And we tend to cheat on this. Usually you show a proper CMB body, you know, yeah. as a spectrum. So a black body, proper Gaussian curve kind of idea. And then you show that eventually if you see it through a galaxy cluster, this, you will see a dint on this curve. And we exaggerated always, you know, we show such a big difference. But in reality, mm -hmm. if you will plot both of them properly, one on top of the other, you will not even see it. Okay, so yeah. it's a tiny effect, but uh, it's very useful to detect uh, more clusters. So it's more useful tool to detect clusters of galaxies, yeah. right? Uh, and, uh, maybe for our viewers, uh, how many galaxies do these clusters have? We said they're made of galaxies, maybe Maud uh, or Anna? Can tell us how many galaxies these clusters have? Yeah, around 100, 1,000 usually. Okay, yeah. wow, that's, that's, a, that's a big that's a <laughs> collection. That's a big collection. And uh, I wanted to ask, so we said it's important, although a small effect, uh, it was predicted. I will go back uh, to this question later, but I want to ask first, why, why is it a good tool to understand the universe? 
through the Z effect. How do we understand the universe by using this uh, effect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thanks to the effect, we can sort of see galaxy cluster, which uh, allows us to understand like the structure of the universe, because as some of you may know, uh, there is this cosmic web structure, which looks a bit like a neural network uh, of the universe itself. And um, uh, where there is galaxy cluster, it's very dense. So you can, by tracing galaxy cluster, you can trace the, the structure of the universe too. And with the structure, you can sort of uh, deduce like how could that structure have ha occurred in the first place, have happened. And that gives you some information on how the universe uh, property might be actually. So this structure is made out of uh, galaxies, right? Uh, and so, then we can trace that. Yes, please, Anna. Uh, no, just going to comment about the structure mm -hmm. part, right? Like you have filaments in between. But mm -hmm. if you can detect these two and you know, other studies have shown us, so like through optical light, like, you know, visible light that, you know, we're used to when we observe uh, galaxies, we see that until certain separation of these two, you could trace, or galaxy clusters, excuse me, you could trace some filaments, some gas in between them. Mm -hmm. At some point, it's too large to separation, you cannot really trace it and sometimes it's too close that you cannot differentiate what's a filament and what's really a galaxy cluster but there are some ranges where you can see this and that's uh because the mod was interesting and she's actually the one that works with that effect <laughs> <laughs> great um, uh, i'm jealous i don't know more about this effect so you can enlighten me please mod <laughs> sorry to interrupt <laughs> uh, <laughs> no problem um uh but uh, if i may say like Mm -hmm. And you can see that Mott is really in the cosmology part, right? Mm -hmm. And she will tell you all about like counting clusters and like how they're important. And they tell you all these little tiny parameters that measure what really our universe is, right? So we go and measure every little thing and we say, oh, in this direction is this, in this direction is that. And all those parameters describe what we know. Uh, but galaxy clusters are actually objects that you can use as astrophysical labs. And uh, that's the part I will tell you because you know, I don't, I don't do as much cosmology, but if you observe with the Sunai of Seldovich effect, you observe actually something that is proportional to the pressure. You could convert it on that. So you can use this effect also to study what really is happening inside the clusters. You know, how do they form as objects? So not only using them as tools, but to understand these for objects that are just forming. So you can use them for the larger scales, which is the large scale structure the skeleton of our universe, basically. Right. And you can also use it for uh, what is inside the skeleton to understand you oh, know, yeah, the yeah. marrow bone. <laughs> yeah. uh, that yeah. is you great. Can, you can do very precise astrophysics, measure temperature, mm -hmm. mass, and everything really. So, yeah. and, you, and I think Anna mentioned that you can understand what the universe is made of, these small parameters, uh, so mm -hmm. we can... Uh, can you tell us a bit more on that, a little bit? Yes, yeah, so basically with the different flavor of the SZ effect, you can constrain um, cosmological parameters, uh, different uh, cosmological parameters, for example, with the kinetic SZ effect, because you probe the velocity of the cluster, you also probe the velocity of the structure themselves, and there is a parameter called the growth of structure, which measure all the structure growth, how fast and everything. And you can uh, get that through the Z effect, um, which is very interesting for cosmology. Can we use it to uh, get the ingredients for our universe? Uh, what it is made of, uh, how it is evolving. So this is this is what we're talking, right? In, in yeah. Yes, uh, but uh, I wouldn't say, so on that I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think you can constrain all of the parameters with only this effect. So uh, you can use it with other uh, effects to constrain better the parameters. Okay. Yeah, so I, you know, for those of us who follow us on AOT, you uh, Eleni gave a talk about the cosmology, right, and how this mm -hmm. works, and what I remember is that you also say we use different props to measure this, right, mm -hmm. so... It's like if we go and measure the table and we say, okay, I measure it with a ruler, I measure it with my hand, right? And eventually you want to get the best measurement you can, right? So it's the same for these parameters and galaxy clusters because it's just now when we really can use them. It's what they're bringing is 
real certainty to know. So like they're reducing the errors of what we already knew. So mm -hmm. if you imagine the example of the table, you say, oh, before I measure the table to be 10 centimeters, plus or minus like three fingers. <laughs> I don't know how much is that. Oh, or with a beer, beer bottom. Exactly, or with beer. <laughs> but eventually you go and say, well, actually those three centimeters, like, you know, these three fingers mean this much centimeters. Mm -hmm. And you can combine all the results. And then you say, well, I have something that is so specific that I can know so well the properties that then I can use it to really reduce the errors in this. So instead of going plus or minus three centimeters, you go 0.5 centimeters, for example. And then you really know what the table is made of, or in this case, the universe for us. That is, that is a very good point. And I thank you for this example of everyday life. Uh, so we can understand the effect, the different effect of measurements and how we can improve our measurements. Uh, I have so many questions for you guys. I re I'm really interested <laughs> in this effect. Um, so uh, I had this question before from Maud's uh, presentation and it, it stuck into my brain. Uh, they predicted the effect from physics, right? So mm. we're talking about physics here in 1969. So I, my question is when it was uh, confirmed through observations, when it was the first observation and uh, with what instrument telescope uh, that made us understand that, okay, this is the Z effect and we will call it a Z effect, you know. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I'm not too sure exactly of the date or anything, but I thought that, I think that was much later, much later, yes. I don't know if Anna knows more about that, maybe. For the detection of the SR effect? Mm. Um, I will say that's uh, early 2000s, probably. Mm. So ah. I work with one Apex set data, which is a survey, and it was the first survey done, targeted survey to observe with this effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was performing between 2000 and 2007. Before that, there were observations, because we knew about the effect, but really specific. So, for example, there are big, big clusters uh, that we can that we knew existed from other observations. So we went there and we said, okay, yeah, we really can see it. But there was never anything before 2000 about, you know, having a sample or having a lot of observations about this. Or okay, so it became big um, survey after Apex, right? Apex is uh, a radio telescope. Apex is a yeah. radio telescope in Chile, and mm -hmm. it observes at uh, in millimeter wavelengths. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at some point. There was this uh, big project in the U.S. called South Pole Telescope, which I think they has been presented here a couple of times. And they wanted to test the instrument that they were going to put there to detect these galaxy clusters, you know, to detect this effect. So they created a small instrument to test it, and it was put in Apex, which was the telescope in Chile, to test it. And that's how we actually been evolving through this. So it's kind of been every step of the time, which it happens with every telescope, right? Mm -hmm. You test it, you see what it goes better, then you move it to the next one, and... That was in 2000, but now we are in, so South Pole Telescope is SPT, and that was SPT-1, and now we are going for Generation 4, of, you know, updates. On, in wow. Two. It sounds like a PlayStation. It kind I'm of joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. So this is the future. We are talking about dedicated surveys now. With a, So these are ground. These are telescopes on the ground, right? It is it's very hard to do in the ground. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've, then if in order to observe it across the whole spectrum, uh, you need to observe at really high altitudes in order to avoid the humidity, you know, and uh, in order to get the biggest um, spatial uh, space that you can find in the atmosphere, you know, to get this observation. And but and Mod is working on that, actually. That's a future project that is coming. But before that, the best observations we got were from space. Because since this effect is so small, the noise from the atmosphere, so to observe it and to skip all this vapor column that we have between the atmosphere and us, is very hard. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, to really model all that noise, you know, it's like when you take a picture and it's humid outside and you can see it almost in your picture. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same idea, you know, in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, you take this picture and we have to remove all this. And since the effect is so sensible, you have to be so careful with this. So... Earth is great, space is amazing, you know, it's a <laughs> motivation. Yes, but the, the, the problem of space is really, it's much more expensive and that's why it doesn't happen as much as we would like it to happen. But, yes. 
Um, yeah, the, the telescope, uh, some of us are building, you know, especially Germany and US, Canada, CCAT Prime is going to be built in Chile at uh, 5,600 meters, which is very high in altitude, <laughs> uh, in a desert, um, because that's the place where there is very little vapor in the atmosphere because that's really dry. And it's mostly sunny uh, every day, very low rain and very dry atmosphere. So um, that would probably provide very good uh, measurements. That's correct. We yeah. have a question actually from no, the No, wait, chat. I, will go, I oh. will go to the questions from the chat, but I'm being very selfish here. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit it. I, I want to know more. So oh, I will go through my questions first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I wanted to make a, um, uh, to ask a, for a clarification. You said from space, is it space balloons or is a telescope outside Earth's um, atmosphere? Like uh, Chandra, for example, the ones we used. You said you, <laughs> sorry, Anna, you ah. said we, we ah, observe, no, we can observe. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> I was just waiting for my answer. Um, no, the, there were some experiments with the space balloons, but the observations are with the Planck mission, and Planck was a satellite uh, located at L2, for those astronomers who know what that means, but just located in a very good spot in the space that actually allow us to observe the whole sky multiple times, and it observed around six rounds uh, with, you know, a full coverage between frequencies of 30 gigahertz to 600 gigahertz, you know, so... And, a lot of little lines of this spectra that we already know how it works. So we could really cover it at different specific points. Great. Um, Planck was the one that uh, also confirmed the cosmic microwave background and got better uh, detections on the, these fluctuations that uh, right. uh, Maud was uh, yes, referring to before, right? Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. The image I showed was uh, is from Planck. The very first satellite was Kobe, but uh, they had very low resolution, let's say, so they couldn't observe like a uh, very uh, tiny fluctuation. Then uh, the US 10W map, which did better than Kobe, and uh, finally Europe came in with Planck, which did the most precise measurement to this day of the fluctuation of the cosmic microwave background, yes, of the temperature fluctuation. Yeah. I mean, in a way, you can see it as, uh, you know, when you go to the doctor for eye doctor and they test you for glasses, <laughs> and you start seeing all blurry things. Yeah. I, I think we kind of went on that way. You know, we, we, we were blind and we had an idea and uh, we went with Kobe and then we saw and you, it's when you see the letters and instead of seeing an A and a B and a C, you see a smash, but you're like, oh, it's like letters. <laughs> and then you went one step further, you're like, oh, I see the A, but not really the B and C or not the shadow that they produce, you know, and then we've been going every little step to, to see it, to focus and see it mm -hmm. properly. I hope you don't reach a point where you don't understand the difference, because <laughs> when I go to the eye doctor, this is what happens to me. He tells me, is this better or this? I'm like, oh, it's the same. <laughs> In a way, that's actually what happened with the work we do, right? And our, why our, um, our work is so important to be precise and correct is, you go and you already have the definition, but you start, oh, I don't know if it's the previous one was better or this one was better, you know. And when we correct for our images, so as I was saying, right, you want to remove all that noise that you observe, you might end up in that and you might end up playing a little bit with just putting filters, the same as you do Instagram with your pictures, you know, just that kind of idea or like distinguishing is this better or the other by just using basic mathematics, using basic statistics and assuming a lot of things. It's, this effect and this, you know, this goes with a lot of assumptions of how the objects are supposed to behave, like how the galaxy clusters behave, what, uh, how they're formed, uh, are they all, you know, stable, are they actually crossing one another, another, you know, things like that. Uh, okay, so I have two questions from my list and another two from the live chat. <laughs> well, actually, there are three questions from my list. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll put them together. Okay, so I wanted to ask uh, if we can, we, again, I think the beer is working. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how can we combine the EZ measurements with other data? Uh, and if we do it and why we do it? And uh, in the background, you can hear my son screaming. And <laughs> Okay, 
And uh, if this uh, provides some further information about galaxy clusters, there's the space between galaxies within the clusters and, and the galaxies in the clusters. I think that was also a question from the live chat, if we can get information about the galaxies themselves. A big question. Do you want to go ahead, Mont? You want to go? <laughs> well, uh, I, I haven't done much of that myself, but I know you usually combine SZ with uh, X-ray um, to get some temperature measurement. So, yeah, yeah it's totally something we do. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, the most common that we combine is uh, with X-ray, as Mot said. Um, this is a bit technical, but when you observe X-ray. X-rays are biased towards the more dense clusters just by the way they have observed, like, you know, the emission in X-rays happens, so by the physics that happens. Uh, it tends to be more biased towards, like, the fat clusters, so to say. Uh, so combining... Don't be judgmental. I'm not judgmental. I love fat <laughs> clusters. They're easy to detect. <laughs> Uh, but combining that with, uh, as said, allows us, for example, to have a big picture of what's the actual distribution of the clusters in the space, right? So we don't go only seeing the big ones, but we can obtain more information. And, you know, again, this goes important for cosmology, for example. Um, another thing is that one big assumption we tend to do when we observe with this effect is we assume the temperature of the cluster. And usually that comes from X-ray observations. You know, mm -hmm. nowadays, and uh, we have a colleague, Ian Sertler, he actually did a work where he showed that combining a lot of these observations will help us create like a, an upper limit of what the temperatures for clusters could be. So now we're getting into the point that we have so many observations, we really can get statistical information like these ones to settle better how the clusters behave. But. Uh, so you, if you have more information about the clusters themselves from another probe, which is the X-rays, then you can use the Z effect to trace other properties. So that's why you use the combination, really right? Yeah. It's also because, so the X-rays are emitted by the intracluster medium, mm -hmm. which is the gas or like the, see, the plasma that is around between, around the galaxies. And so the X-ray and the SZ are observing the same thing, right? Uh, so it's like if you take an X-ray of your body, but you take a, uh, an MRI, you see different things, right? One sees the bones, the other ones might see tissue. So it's the same. It's kind of difficult if we take optical observations where we can see the galaxies and the stars because they're giving us information about other objects dentro this, inside this soup of a set, you know, of like these galaxy clusters. You know. And can you get information about the individual galaxies within these clusters through the Z effect? Or is it uh, only, I mean, okay, we said you can trace clusters of galaxies. Can you get any information about the galaxies themselves? Mm, not really. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess technically, yes, the galaxies could produce the effect, right? So they could interact with the photons uh, background, but the effect will be so small that we don't detect it. Uh, so, you know, one, one thing is what you were asking before, where like you say, oh, do a lot of photons interact with these objects, mm -hmm. right? And it's not that many. The difference is we have a lot of galaxy clusters, right? Like it's a big area, it's thousands of galaxies in a space with a gas, right? But if you reduce that by a thousand and you put it in a small galaxy, then your chances of the photons interacting with the right electrons and getting to us, you know, reduces. Mm. Uh. I ha okay, so before I, I find this question from the live chat that I, I lost somewhere in the chat, uh, I want to ask you if there are simulations of uh, the Z effect and what they tell us and how we can use them, if you know. And if you don't know, ah, there you go. Thank you very much, Sandra, our savior. And then if you don't know that, I will ask you what Sandra just posted. <laughs> um, there are simulations. Yes, there, there are different ways of simulation. So Mod and Jens, Mod probably can ex will explain this part, but uh, they work on creating like sky models of what, like how will affect what we observe, and they they you know model all these things that we know how they're supposed to behave. As in, if you put particles like uh, in what we usually see cosmology particles, you know, you put boxes and they start evolving, and eventually they create a galaxy. Usually, we don't see the SR effect on those mostly because they get painted at some point, so to say. So 
instead of letting all those particles evolve until that point, because it's so expensive for the computers to do all these calculations, we take assumptions and we say, well, you know, we already know these effects happens. It always happens like this. So let's put this information here and see. Yeah, we, then we use those simulations more to understand how to use a set as a tool than as, a, you know, as an observation to understand the galaxy clusters. Yes, so it's important uh, and a very useful tool nowadays that we have better computers uh, to get us faster to understanding the effects on our data, right? Uh, and more can yeah. tell you all about that oh, one. Oh, yes, <laughs> great. Yeah, it, it's, really, it's really important, actually. So I've been working on two simulations. So one of them is what we call hydrodynamical simulation. So in that case, there is actually particles, bions, so matter particles that evolve, and there is actually physics that is put inside those simulations, so equation that tells, okay, how should those particles behave, how should they collapse together to form structures, and how should they interact to produce effects like the Z effect, for example. And this simulation, the magneticum simulation that uh, I've been running a bit, I didn't make it myself, it was done by Klaus Dolag and uh, his team in Munich, and it's running on a supercomputer also in Munich, and it's one of the most, uh, like in the top 10 of the most powerful computer in the world. And I can tell you to run it on like a seven by seven degree or 40 by 40 degree patch, which is quite small because the, the, the sky is way much bigger than that. It takes a week, a week of full supercomputer computation. Uh, which is a lot because uh, the simulation produce a lot, a lot of particle in a big box. Then they need to let it evolve to form structure. They need to inject physics in it, physical meaning. And then, yes, you can produce, produce a map of how the SZ effects will look like in real life. Mm -hmm. But it's just a patch. It's not even a full sky map. <laughs> And then you can get, as Anna explained it, some uh, simulation that are dark matter only. So in that case, it's also particle in a box, but there is no variance. Uh, it's only dark matter, which basically gives you like the potential where the structure are going to fall, collapse, and form. But then, because there is no real matter, you need to paint it on it. Uh, we say that way in astrophysics. So you need to say, okay, if there is this big dark matter potential, then it would correspond to a structure looking uh, like that in physics. So then you need to inject uh, on top of those simulations sort of how it would look like, look like in real life. So there is simulation, yes, it's really non-trivial to, mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And if you make a mistake at the beginning, before you start, you press enter, <laughs> you lost a week, eh? Yeah. <laughs> At least. <laughs> yeah. well, no one can... has done that ever. No one. <laughs> no one has made a mistake. No one. <laughs> yeah, um, well, you, you can stop it, but the worst is really when you launch it and you let it run for a week and then you realize, oh, I didn't run the right parameter or something. <laughs> then, yes, you really lost a week. Uh, there is a question. Well, there are two. I think my favorite question today was if you can detect UFOs with a <laughs> Zegger effect, and I would say yes. I wish. <laughs> As a non-expert, I would say yes. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but, uh, I, okay, I think the question that I had I misunderstood was if, if you can detect individual galaxies with a Z effect, and not clusters of galaxies, because you said you can use it for big, like hundreds and thousands of galaxies. So if you can find individual galaxies, let's say they don't belong to a cluster, can you use it or is it not? No. No, not no. really. It's not uh, sensitive enough. The, no, the effect will be too small for mm -hmm. us to detect it. Yeah, they are, sorry, our, our, uh, our telescopes are not sensitive enough to... Exactly. <laughs> from the galaxies. But uh, related to that question before, you were saying how, like, okay, how do we know if two galaxies are, you know, in the same cluster? What observations yeah. we use? And SR cannot do that. But again, this all goes combined, right? So we have SR that shows the gas, the intracluster medium. We have 
optical data that shows the stars, the actual galaxies, X-rays that also tell us about the intercluster medium, this gas in between, and you can have infrared. And infrared gives you information about the stars, you know, that are being born, um, or the galaxies, the different galaxies. And using this information, you actually can calculate something that is called like the clustering parameter. So you can use different things to measure like how far are the galaxies and what is really a range where you say, well, if I extend my arms this far and I touch someone, is that my friend and lives inside my own house or is someone else, you know? Um, so you would really use all physics and all the tools that we have to study these objects to get to, the, to, get to say they're galaxy clusters, to get to say which galaxies. And some people go and study each of these galaxies in detail, right? Uh, usually there are one old galaxy in the center and a lot of small ones around it that are not as active. But people go and, you know, focus only on those objects because each of these little things is kind of their own universe, you know, and I think that's, that's kind of important sometimes for the audience to, to follow that so many things and so many details in every intrinsic thing we do, you know, and it's, it's hard to, you know, to cover all that with just one effect or one observation. Yes, it's, a, it's very important to combine observations, uh, different tools, different wavelengths, different intensities and sensitivities in order to understand our universe because there are different effects, right? Yeah. And that's, uh, that's what we learn from all this. Uh, and for me, it's amazing how uh, theoretical astrophysicists can predict something 40 years before uh, we managed to do it on a, a large scale. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing, and it shows the understanding of the human brain of physics, and then how, uh, by developing tools, we manage to make it an observation and study it in detail. Uh, As for UFO question, I think yes. we'll have to be a very fast and hot UFO. Ah, great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, very, very nice, very nice. Uh, and. Uh, plasma, right? Because plasma. this is what... Yeah. Yeah. Ion, okay, yes, that's very important. So, guys, uh, we can detect uh, UFOs under certain conditions. They're plasma, hot, right? right? Yeah. right? Yeah. And, and fast. And fast, yeah. And fast, <laughs> there you go. Very nice, fantastic. Uh, I would like to thank you so much for this fantastic conversation. Uh, I think we learned a lot. I learned a lot. Now I am a fan of the Z effect, uh, for sure, because I, I think the potential for future discoveries are very big, and that is very important. And now we have two, two tools uh, and uh, future uh, telescopes that yeah. will give us better understanding. 2021, uh, wait for it. 2021, it's going to be our year. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we will get the Sika telescope, hopefully. Yes, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Maud. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Great presentation, thank you. Um, there is one question, so I will ask you for a favor. There is one question on the chat. Uh, I will not reveal it. You know which one it is. Please go and answer it. We don't have more time to answer it, but please go and answer it. Thank you very much, and uh, we will go to our next presentation now. And I will welcome Felix and Alan. And I will have some beer. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, I will have some beer uh, in the meantime. Good. So, uh, I guess I'm back. Yes. Okay, I hope you can see me. I hope yes. you can hear me. Yes, and thank cheers. you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Felix. Thank you for being uh, still here. We talked for a long time, but... I was so interested with this event, uh, event, sorry, and oh my god, this beer is really getting me, <laughs> this effect. I, I was following your discussions, it was a, it's a very interesting topic. Yes, and uh, I think, I tell you the truth, okay, I've been, I was in Argelander for three and a half years, I, I listened to many talks and many meetings, and it's the, the truth, I say it is the first time I understand this effect so well, it's been broken down. And uh, it actually created more questions for me, and I want to learn more about it. So, I will stop talking about the Z effect now, and we will go, right? We will go to Alan Roy from uh, Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. Alan, are you with us? Good evening, Eleni. Good to, good to be with you. <laughs> very, very good to have you with us. Uh, 
very happy that you are here to talk to us about uh, something different now, right? Okay, we get these observations from space, but what do we do with them apart from science? We do something else, right? We can create art. Yes, and in this case, with this artwork, you can hear the Earth turn. Wow, is, uh, fantastic. Uh, before, okay, I forgot. Uh, bef I'm too excited. Sorry, guys. It's, uh, it's too, too much excitement tonight. Uh, and uh, I wanted to introduce you to our audience. Although we had you with us uh, two weeks ago for the... Two weeks ago, for the Astronomy on Tap on the Couch event, you, as you presented uh, another part of this very nice uh, presentation. Uh, it's good to introduce you again to our audience. So, let me. So, uh, Dr. Alan Roy is a staff astronomer at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn and uh, has led instrumentation development programs with international cooperation over many years to enable imaging of black holes with sufficient sharpness to see the event horizon. So pretty much what we saw uh, last year with the first picture of the black hole. Uh, before joining MPIFR, he worked in New Mexico and India in astrophysics and advised also on telescope design for the search of extraterrestrial intelligence. He's currently developing a novel receiver design that will enable dual use of concentrating solar power stations built primarily for renewable energy production uh, as by far the, the largest and most sensitive radio telescopes in the world. Uh, and you will use them for science. <laughs> but we don't have you for this today. We have this presentation by you. It is on our website, so if people are interested, they can go and watch it. It's, it is available. But today we have you for something very special different special also <laughs> this was a special project uh, it dates back to 2013 um, when I was contacted by Irvin Brunzeg professor of uh, music in Trondheim so the story began when the Norwegian mapping authority got money from the government to build a radio telescope in uh, Neilasund. And part of the requirements of the funding was that some of the money should go into the arts. And Irvin received the commission from the um, Public Arts uh, Authority to prepare a sonification based on the data that we receive with radio telescopes. And his interest was to give us a different perspective on the world by being able to hear the processes that that we're measuring. And uh, he came to, to Bonn, he worked with me to understand what the data are that we work with, and uh, we gave him some of the samples of the data, and from that he produced the, the sonifications. Uh, I think you have some slides to show us. Would you like to share them? Sure, so we can, sure, yes. We can go through the discussion. And we can this. see also the the creator of this sonification. Uh, not sure that that actually worked. Right it now. worked, It yes. worked, yes, you yes, are seeing... Just, uh, yeah, just put it on uh, presentation mode, please. Okay. Okay, presentation mode. You should now be seeing the first slide with Irvin's photo. Can you confirm you're seeing the first we're slide? We're seeing it within the PowerPoint window. Okay, that's curious because I'm seeing it okay. full, full screen. Let's try that again. I'm seeing it full screen. You're seeing it in the PowerPoint. Yes, it's okay. okay we might. We, we. I think we proceed as it is. Yes, don't That's worry. We, we we just want to find out more information about yes, it. Yes, sure. Yeah. So you're seeing. So it's the the background on on Irvind. Uh, I can show you the telescopes that um, were built as a result of this project. This is in Nayalasund, in 
far in the north of, of Norway. And the question is, why does the mapping authority want radio telescopes? And the answer is they need it as a reference point for making maps. And they, this telescope observes with other telescopes around the world. Um, traditionally, you would use the stars to measure positions on the Earth. This is a, a classic application of astronomy. And uh, today, you get much better precision if you use radio telescopes. And then you use – you measure the distances across the world. Um, these telescopes are observing daily with an international network of, of telescopes. Um, this uses the same kind of technology like, that was used for the uh, black hole shadow picture, right? That's right. It uh, uses interferometry and the, the, the objects we're looking at are um, basically they're quasars. So this is a black hole, very distant, in distant galaxy. At the center of the galaxy, there's gas falling into the black hole. It's getting very hot, and some part of it is squirting out. That makes uh, radio emission, which, which we then um, receive. So the technology itself, uh, sketched like this. So you have telescopes on different continents on the Earth looking up at the quasar. The wave comes in. It arrives first at one telescope and then at the other. And the trick is to record the data and then bring them back to a central point where you compare the arrival times. And you can measure very accurately the distance, the, the time difference in the arrival, and that gives you the distance between the telescopes um, to a fraction of the wavelength that you're observing at, so to centimeter precision across the, the, the size of the world. So uh, they use this, sorry to interrupt you, they use these uh, faraway objects uh, to, as a standard candles, as we say, right, in astronomy, as a reference point. As a, re right? as a reference point, yes. yes. So we have, and what we have are network. these uh, objects? What are they? Th these are uh, quasars. If you look at galaxies, about one in every hundred galaxies has an, a very bright point of light in the center. Mm -hmm. And this bright point can be so bright that it outshines all of the stars in the galaxy. And it flickers. It changes brightness very fast. So that tells us it's very small. So very small but enormously bright. And uh, basically these are um, massive black holes, a billion times the mass of the sun. Mm -hmm. Gas is falling in. It forms a, an accretion disk of material. Uh, Friction inside this accretion disk heats the, the whole disk until it glows. So it glows like a light bulb, but in the filament of a light bulb, but um, par so very large across, parsec across, light year across. So those are the reference points that are at, at great distance. And the advantage for us is because they're very far away, they, they don't move very much. So they're essentially stable reference points that we can use to measure positions on the Earth Wow, so we can have very accurate measurements of uh, distance on our Earth, right? Or distances within the Earth. That's right. Yes. So Fantastic. you would make, make a measurement. Maps, you, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you, 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 have to, you, you have to solve things that simultaneously. You need to measure positions on the sky to get the, mm -hmm. where these things are and what they look like, and at the same time work out where your telescopes are on the Earth and how the Earth is turning as the telescopes are being carried as the Earth rotates. So it's like a so collaboration you, between uh, astronomy and uh, the, how and, do you call this? Ge ge geodesy. Geodesy, geodesy the yes, measurement, sorry. The, the measurement of the Earth. That's right. So when we do astronomy, we use the telescope positions that are measured by the geodesists. And uh, the geodesists are using uh, radio sources that we find as, as astronomers that we find are compact enough for them. So it's a... Uh, collaboration it's a very interesting so interplay a, between disciplines <laughs> and there's fascinating things that you discover about the earth when you do this so you take measurements of a, ne a network of quasars in all different directions and you can measure um, exactly in 3d space where your telescopes are on the earth and you can measure how the Earth is turning, and you discover things like that there are tides in the crust. The ground is going up and down like the, like the tides in the ocean. 
they go up and the ground goes up and down by 20 centimeters every every day you don't notice it because you're standing on the earth and the pole of the earth is wandering around gradually the length of the day is changing you it's um, at, a, at the level of maybe milliseconds a day the changes are coming about because of wind blowing against mountains and that push pushes on the mountains and that changes the speed that the earth rotates that's one part of it and how the ocean circulation oceans are circulating uh, oh, it's incredible the, precision <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful there's a lot of physics if we go to the next slide i can show you one of the results one of the measurements that you you do with the telescopes so this is a map of the world with arrows on it the arrow begins at the location of each radio telescope that is in this network and they've measured their distances with respect to each other and you find over the years that the distances are changing and the continents are moving and they're carrying carrying the telescopes with them so you're able to measure the continental drift and you discover things like above Scandinavia the telescopes are tending to go upwards this is a result of the ice masses that were there in the ice ages that have melted at the time when they were there, they were kilometers thick and they pressed the crust down. And now the, that weight is gone and the crust is rebounding. And you can see that motion as the, uh, as the earth is coming, coming up. Wow. Amazing. And they uh, use quasars for that. That is amazing. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. So I guess uh, you take GPS positioning for granted. Um, where you measure with a radio receiver the, your position relative to the satellites. But the Earth has got all of these irregular movements going on underneath the satellites. And if you didn't measure it and keep track of the changes, you'd be off by hundreds of meters in a year. So if you, you could imagine being in an aircraft on final approach, if you're navigating by GPS, trying to land on the runway, and the runway has moved by 150 meters, <laughs> Oops! So, I don't yes. want to imagine that. <laughs> so it's really important, and this network of telescopes is constantly monitoring the rotation of the Earth and the, all of these irregular movements to keep the navigation systems accurate. The time signals that you hear on the radio, they're kept in sync with the rotation of the Earth through these measurements with the radio telescopes. So you can say that uh, without... Uh, radio astronomy, you wouldn't be able to have a reliable GPS. Indeed, of course. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, general relativistic effects. So Einstein, general relativity is required for GPS to work. And special relativity. Oh, fundamental application of astronomy. Timekeeping, keeping the calendar in sync with the seasons. <laughs> So harvest, plant when you plant, when you harvest, that's um, an integral aspect of astronomy to maintain the calendar. It's so, really nice to see applications of astronomy to our daily lives. Uh, yet another example to the list that we had last time. <laughs> so when uh, Irvind was coming to understand the signals that we were processing, one of the things he was amazed with is just how weak our signals are, that the quasar signal is buried in noise, that only maybe one part in a thousand of the signal coming out of the radio telescope is the, the quasar, and the rest is noise from the receiver, from the atmosphere, but that we could still dig out the signal by comparing it between telescopes. The, all this background noise is different between the two telescopes, and this faint signal from the quasar is common. Uh, and if you integrate over time, you can pick out that common component. Uh, and as a musician, he's accustomed to very high signal to noise. So he found that a very beautiful thing that we were, uh, that mankind had techniques to deal with signals that were that weak. I think that's amazing, and that's something that uh, common people don't understand how. Uh, difficult it is to detect those signals from space that take uh, so much time and travel big distances, millions and billions of light years to reach us. And they lose energy as they, they travel through space because they, 
they go through different uh, objects, right? As we talked before in the previous talk, they will go through a cluster, they will go through gas, so they lose energy. And yet, with our sensitive telescopes, we are able to detect this and uh, not only detect it, provide something to humanity uh, that without it, it cannot function in a modern world, like fly planes. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> It's fascinating that there's some interesting paradoxes there as this uh, universe expands and things are redshifted and where does that energy go? <laughs> the, the energy is lost. <laughs> or another aspect that uh, the question of Olber's paradox, why the sky is dark at night and you can tell something about cosmology from that. I heard about that one. That's a very interesting thing to think about. <laughs> So the well, while we're on this aside, the uh, the problem is if you imagine an infinite universe with stars going off in all directions, then whatever direction you look, your line of sight will eventually land on the surface of a star. So you will see stars in all directions, and the whole sky should be as bright as the surface of the sun. It's like standing in a forest and you see tree trunks in all directions, but the sky is dark and. Ultimately, the, the solution to that is that the universe is, has a finite age. The, the further you look, the further back in time you look until you see to the beyond the time when the first stars turned on. And lucky for us, um, this, when you reach that distance, the sky is not yet completely covered in stars. So you're in the forest, but you're seeing past the edge of the forest before your your sight is completely blocked by tree trunks. Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. So, and this question has first been asked like way before uh, we were thinking about uh, the big whole Big Bang theory and uh, and stuff, yes. right? So that's very interesting. That, 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 yes, that dates back. Anyway, we're we're a bit off the track from the uh, <laughs> from the sonifications. Not very, <laughs> but it's fun. It's okay. We like discussing astronomy, uh, but uh, we're also very interested about this project, uh, which turns radio data to music, right? Uh, uh, I'm not saying it very well, so why no, that, don't you tell fine. us? Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's fine. <laughs> so, Irvind. Uh, uh, took a number of aspects of our data processing signals from when they came out of the telescope right through to the end products of the Earth motions and presented them in music in different ways. Mm -hmm. He's made an installation in the Mapping Authority headquarters in Trondheim where he strings these end to end and they're played in an area of the building so that you can, you can hear the, uh, the different aspects. So I show here a photograph of the corridor where that's played and is using transducers on the glass. Um, that building is closed. It's for the uh, employees of the building, but you can hear it on a live stream on the internet. And I've got a web address there. There's also an app that you can download on the phone and hear the, the live stream. And he's given a TED talk on the, on the project, and there's a link there for that. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's maybe, we, maybe we can put the links later on the chat so people can can see yeah, it. Yeah, right? I, I have the links available. I can do it now. But uh, just to say that I have already shared the live stream uh, on um, our advertising. So people okay. can find it on Facebook. But I will just, uh, not, not here, I will add it on the chat too. Uh, so people can have a look. Okay, thanks. So I won't present, I'll present one piece out of that. Um, and this is the rotation of the Earth. So we took 30 years of daily measurements of where the pole of the Earth is and what the length of the day is. And he's converted this into music. As the Earth turns faster, the pitch goes up. As the Earth turns slower, the pitch goes down. As the position of the axis of the pole goes left and right it the sound shifts into your left ear or into your right ear and as the pole tips away and comes towards you the sound becomes more open or more closed like a oh, sound mm -hmm. so wow. uh, 
I have a graphic here that gives an indication of how the sort of how the uh, Earth rotates. It processes, it mutates, and as the uh, where the rotation axis goes through the crust of the Earth, um, that uh, that moves around in a spiral on the surface of the Earth, moving around by by sixteen meters. So maybe at this point we could listen to the sonification and listen to the Earth spinning in space. This is 30 years of Earth rotation compressed into about 30 seconds of sonification. Uh, is this the sonification we have, right? So yes, we will we, right. will we will play it. Uh, I'm very interested to listen. Okay, so let's listen. Yeah, I'm really excited now too. Feel free to tone that down now if you wish. <laughs> so it wow. sounds. I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it, it. It sounds like a lonely Earth spinning through the blackness of space. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it sounds like the Earth spoke to me. It's. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. And it's exactly that. <laughs> Uh, when you know when the when, where the sound comes from, you try to make the association, and it's yes. fantastic. It's also, what you said, how to as, to identify the different uh, characteristics of the sound. Uh, if you don't know where the sound comes from, yeah, it's a bit like Halloween or from the opera house, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's, yes, yes. it's it's amazing. It's amazing. I, I, I find. The most striking component is the pitch variations, and I'm seeing in my mind the wind blowing against the mountains and the ocean circulation changing. And this is just amazing forces at play. There's a lot going on in the earth. I think I uh, heard like the fast changes between left and right ear. So, ah, yes. uh, you had you had that, and then uh, on a bit larger time scale, say you have this uh, pitch change, and you hear both at the same time, and you can imagine like how the Earth uh, changes, like both uh, both temporally and uh, sp spatially. This is uh, amazing. Yes, yeah. The the Earth is not as a rigid body that we're standing on. It's not a rock. It's moving around. <laughs> Great. Uh, so I thought you had some more slides. There's one one last start. slide. I, yes. I leave you with leave you simply with an advertisement for the for the app, the VLBI Music. That's uh, it's got a string of many um, different sonifications, different aspects of the data, plus uh, plus graphics that that go with it. Good. Uh, if you can share your screen again, so we can. Ah, uh, yes. So we can see it. A couple of steps to do that. Oh, I think I will go download that right away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we haven't shared uh, on the live stream uh, the links. So I will share in my uh, private capacity now. 
now now you will know my private uh, <laughs> name <laughs> or or maybe not i will i will go through another account there you go <laughs> so also the audience can uh, click on these links and find the um, uh, the application on the is it for uh, iPhones or for Androids? What is it uh, for? Uh, should be, should be for both. Ah, fantastic! That's very good. Uh, I will as soon as we finish, I will download it and uh, and listen to more. I really enjoyed this opera song, and I will have it playing uh, on the next Halloween as Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> It's such an interesting approach because normally everything, uh, everything that we see, all the data that we have are visualized, right? We have look look at plots, at graphs, and yes. whatever. And this is just a completely different way of uh, yeah, not looking at it. But you know what I mean. <laughs> I, another that uh, that was acoustic was the LIGO detection of gravitational waves in the press conference when. This was played the the sweep up of the in spiral of two black holes um, merging into one, as heard by the LIGO detector. Uh, that sent a chill down your spine. It, for me, it was as if you were sitting in the detector with ears that were four kilometers across, and you're you're feeling the vi the ripples on on the space, and you you're able to listen to the whole universe. This was just fantastic. Yes, exactly. That's uh, that's really amazing. And there are other songs, right? Many other songs, different types. Is that correct? In the sonifications, yes. Yes, uh, yes. The, from the VLBI data, the data arriving at the sampler as from the quasar coming out of the receiver, the sample data, he slowed down massively. And you could hear the individual bits arriving. And that was remarkable for thinking that you were actually hearing the, the data, the, the signal itself arriving. For Irvin, an amazing aspect was that he was dealing with a signal that had started on its way to us before the Earth had even formed. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is a very important point to understand that these objects are so far away, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they've seen a lot of history in that um, telescopes are like time machines. The further away you look, the further back in time. It's very convenient for us that we can see how things actually evolved. It's like a window to to the past, right? Yes, yes. And, uh, uh, and we can, we can really make a music of that past, <laughs> which is <Yes>. fascinating. <laughs> Wow. Uh, he made sonifications, how the telescopes move, mm -hmm. um, which uh, was um, uh, like a, a choreography, uh, pictures going up and down. Uh, so he was, the telescopes move around a network of quasars, and depending on the position, north or south, he produced a pitch or east, west. And. Um, that's what you sonic. play during the astronomy on the couch event, right? Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, that's much much more musical rhythm. <laughs> yeah, this is available but, to watch on the on the website. Sorry, on the website of Astronomy on Tap, so you can find the live, the recorded live there, and you can watch it. And uh, also the relevant links. I think you can find yes. all the information. Um, if we are missing any links from what uh, Alan has given us, we will post it on our social media so you guys can go and have a, a listen for yourselves on your free time. <laughs> so follow us on Facebook yep. so you don't miss out. Not only on Facebook, also on uh, subscribe on YouTube, you know, say everything. On Instagram <laughs> and Twitter, we have everything. And we have also TikTok. <laughs> don't laugh, it's true. <laughs> and we have TikTok. It, it's not crazy yet, but it can become very crazy. Uh, so follow us also on TikTok. If you're watching this now, the subscribe button is very close. So oh, you can just subscribe to our YouTube. That is a valid point. I, I think if they don't subscribe, then we're very sad. Very, very sad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and you do help us a, a lot with doing that. And you don't miss out on any of the videos that we put up. 
Yes, uh, and you can find, as I said before, uh, Alan has given us a talk before on his other project uh, about how to turn this uh, solar power, um, <laughs> my God, plates, uh, to, to use them for science, right? That, that was a, f a really fun idea, this uh, using solar power towers uh, for radio astronomy. Uh, so the idea, uh, I hadn't known of the existence of these before a colleague came back from Spain. These things are enormous. They're um, flat plate mirrors, 10 by 10 meters on a side, uh, spread over an area of maybe this particular one was 600 meters across, but they go up to like three kilometers across, all reflecting the sunlight up onto a tower. And during the daytime, they collect the solar energy and make electricity. And at nighttime, they're lying idle. And the thought was to make the world's biggest radio telescope by putting a radio receiver on top. And then you have like three kilometers of collecting area. So go okay. and watch that talk by Alan if you haven't done that yet. It's yes. here on our YouTube. Fantastic. I think we have a question from the live chat that we we missed, right? Uh, how, okay, I'll try to... Yes, we do. How is the speed up factor from the Earth real motion to the music we heard. Oh, okay. Yes. So the data were measured over 30 years, and what we hear, heard there ran maybe a, a minute. So the speed up factor is just the ratio of those two. Mm -hmm. So 30 the, years of monitoring the earth, right? To produce yes. a one minute song. Wow. The, the pitch variations are magnified. The variations in the length of day uh, like a millisecond in 24 hours. So that's a pitch change that you wouldn't hear by the ear, but it's been magnified in this sonification, so you can hear it. That is amazing. And uh, it's also fantastic how you collect all this data many deca decades to produce uh, music. I, I find it fascinating. <laughs> and uh, it is truly art, you know? Uh, I think it's a yes. bit romantic if you if you say it uh, that and it uh, goes with the nature of astronomers. We are also a bit uh, of romantics, yeah. thinking we can detect phenomena that that uh, the human brain cannot <laughs> understand. And uh, you know, it's fascinating to get another perspective in the world around you <laughs> in a way that you you don't see. Uh, it's also good to interact with the public uh, this way, you know. I think to produce art uh, through astronomical observations yeah. is a very good tool to bring uh, people closer to science, to understand uh, that uh, what we do may have applications, like what you said, the GPS. And uh, we had another talk at some point, another sonification presentation by... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, my brain um, has stopped working. Oh my God, I am really sorry, I forgot. <laughs> um, about, the, I think it was the Mercury transit. Yes, Mercury transits. Yes, yes. Uh, I, w I will blame <laughs> yes. the corona situation and uh, that I don't remember anything. Days feel like months. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we have many examples of sonification. Uh, I think it was uh, Paul Hombach doing yes. that. Right? Yes, that's it. That's it. yes, thank you. I was trying to remember <laughs> his surname. Thank you so yes. much. And I'm sorry to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I and, think he will uh, forgive you. Yes, and uh, so there are many examples of uh, using astronomical data to produce art. And uh, I, th I find it fascinating, a very good way to communicate with the public. Yes. Good. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions, but uh, if uh, the people from home want to ask something, you can always contact us on our social media. And uh, if we cannot answer it ourselves, we will ask our speakers in private and we will provide the answer with you, uh, to you. Uh, uh, Felix, anything more? Um, nothing really, but do subscribe to our YouTube follow us on social media. <laughs> you can, cannot say that <laughs> often enough. <laughs> yes. And uh, thanks for sticking around, everyone. So. 
Yes, uh, and I hope you liked as much as we did. We would like to thank Alan for this uh, presentation uh, of the certification. Thank you very much, Alan. And we'd like to thank uh, Felix, uh, who you want to thank. I wonder, yeah, thanks for everyone for watching. Thanks to the team for all their work they did today. Having a live event is uh, also not that easy. Uh, although we are not in the pub. And of course, thanks to our wonderful speakers today. We who had enlightened us. Yes, we had Reinhard. Uh, that was a very a fantastic talk. And I wish we can give he can give it in English at some point. I would love that to, to hear it in English because, uh, you know, I, I don't understand very well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it, was, it was a great talk. It was a great talk, right? I, I figured that I really liked the slides uh, and and the topic. Uh, we would like to thank Maud and Anna for the discussion. And, okay, of course, the fantastic quiz that was made by, Sa by Sandra and Sven and presented by Sven. And we had so much fun playing the quiz. I was playing the quiz. I was trying to find uh, all wrong, but ap apparently I didn't. I, I lost. <laughs> Even, even we from the team do not know all the answers. Um, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, but uh, it was a good quiz. And guys, if you enjoyed that, then next time we'll have another one for you. So uh, probably next month, unless we can go back to Fiddlers, we will have a virtual event. Uh, so we renew our rendezvous for next month. Uh, <laughs> with more talks and quizzes and discussions. And uh, as Felix said, subscribe, right? Yes, please do. Okay, good. Let's uh, say good night to everyone. Thank you very much for watching. It was a pleasure hosting this event for you. And uh, if you missed part of it or you want to watch it again, tomorrow it will be available to rewatch on YouTube. Thank you very much uh, and have a good night. Good night, everyone.